I'll have you guys in Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Okay, uh, general public comments. Uh, public's welcome to comment on anything that they would like. Uh, three minutes, name and address, please. Sir, your three minutes have started. My name is Michael Doyle. I own FelmanToday.me. I called the DEA's office in Boston four times and left a message. I uh, left it for uh, Tony Pettigrew, and then I called Laura Harris in Washington, D.C. Today, uh, Yesterday, I called back and spoke to Kathy, the secretary for Michael Ferguson, the special agent in charge, and I asked this question. Is there any protocol that uh, prohibits a DEA agent assigned by the town of Scarborough from the police department from having an affair with the confidential informant and compromising a case. And I'm waiting to hear back from Mr. Ferguson or one of his uh, people. Uh, my information is that a police officer was assigned to the case, slept with the CI, the CI got pregnant, he left his wife, and married the CI. This case was three Class A felonies for drug dealing. The case was compromised to a point where it was settled, my information is, on time served and dismissed. And I'm, I'm letting the, the council know that I own FalmouthToday.me. I've got 24 stories about the police department in Scarborough, and I'm going to continue to pursue this. I'm waiting to hear back from Mr. Ferguson to see if there's a page in the operation manual that prohibits this or condones it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone next? Name and address. Three minutes. Well, what I have to say isn't going to be as <laughs> big as that was, <laughs> but <laughs> nonetheless, um, I was at the candidate meet the candidates meeting last night, and it was uh, very nice. I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed listening to everyone. The one thing that I need to comment on is that um, there is a problem in town with the voters being apathetic. Nobody comes out to vote. They don't vote. And why is this? What is it that makes the people not want to come out and vote? Because there are important issues. I, I can't figure it out. It's one of the most important things that an American can do is to vote. And the only thing that I can think of is they think, well, it's politics as usual. Why bother? And that could be. But the council seems to also want to take into consideration these apathetic voters. And I don't understand it because I've said this before about a rumor started on Higgins Beach about a private citizen. Over the weekend, a rumor about my husband which wasn't true. And these people call and say they're anonymous. They won't give their names. Or they give their names and say they want to remain anonymous. There's something that's just not right about this. Those people, and maybe they're here tonight, maybe they're at home, I don't know. But people who call and don't stand up for what they believe in and make up a lie, my father, who is a World War II disabled veteran, my son, who is a wounded warrior Marine, retired, would call those people cowards. And that's what I'm here to say tonight. They don't have to lie. We come up here, we stand up here, we look you all in the face, we tell you what you think, whether you like us or not like us. But at least we do it. So the people who have to lie, don't listen to them. Don't take them into consideration. They're not worth it. 
They're cowards. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Some of my three minutes getting into the aisle there. <laughs> my name is Bud Hansen. I live in the condo at Stony Creek Drive. Uh, a couple of things I want to talk very quickly. First off, is that uh, I had a very narrowing experience personally just a couple of weeks ago in trying to cross Route 1. I live in Stony Creek, and in order to get to Route 1, I have to walk up Commerce Drive. There are walk lights at Commerce Drive, and as I as I test them, the good for about 20 seconds for me to walk across that interstate when the traffic is going north and south on Route 1. As I push the button, which is on the back side of the pole, which is hard to see to walk across, the lights flash, and I have to wait because the guys and gals who want to make the red light step on the gas. So I'm back on the strike. My, my light is flashing. Now I only get 15 seconds to get across <laughs> the street. So I finally get over in the finally end of the street on the um, uh, fast side going south, and y as you know, you can turn right on red. There's four opportunities there to do. The light doesn't show everybody who's walking out there. As I got into that line, two cars came by, and they're two different vehicles that was in their way. I was able to get across. Um, I walked there because I go over behind the high school and walk around the park. I do it often. I find that, uh, and I came back that same day, and I was leaving now from the park side going over to get on the Commerce Drive, and I stepped off the street, the horns are blowing, I get over with the traffic coming up from the south, was a person who wanted to turn right on the Commerce Drive, I let them go, and I'm in the street, traffic has stopped, and they're waving to me, watch out, look out, you're in trouble. And I go across the street, and Fortunately for me, I made it, and so did the driver. I got down to the uh, white buildings on the corner, and the person who was driving couldn't get into the parking area. And I knocked on the window and said, thank you very much. And I got the rectal uh, ex expression, as well as they told me, if you don't like crossing Route 1, why don't you move? So I'm thinking, this is not really a police issue. I think maybe it's a transportation issue or a safety issue. And I don't uh -huh. know who to go to. Point the way. Uh, I don't think the police is at fault with this. I think a very easy solution would be to add another five or six seconds to the walk light. Uh, no. Absolutely. Is that possible? However, as we know, when you have a solution to a problem, you create another problem because of the solution. So I understand that. <coughs> my other concern was, my time is running out, is I've been looking and reading the newspaper articles on the hockey center. And just a couple of quick words. Please, no hockey center in Metropolitan Oak Hill. Maybe I believe in hockey. I played for it in the backyard, and I played for it when I was in command. <coughs> My oldest brother, Ralph, played with Gary Merrill's hockey team over in Cape Elizabeth. So I know the sport is very exciting at the very beginning. Uh, later on, as time goes by, I'll tell you about an experience that I had personally on the John Fitch Highway in Fitchburg with George Wallace Planetarium and... and uh, hockey rink. It was successful for just a couple of years. It finally failed. Rock concerts came, the dust came, and there was no, not enough restrooms, and they used the outside facilities, which is grass, both men and women. Uh, across the street where I live, it was a three apartment complex. It was an absolute <coughs> disaster. So I think probably when the time comes to decide what we're going to do for the hockey rink. I like the idea of a hockey rink, but please, not in Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. <coughs> Next, anyone else? I'll pick them up. Seeing no one else, I'll close. No. Oh. Oh. If you're going to speak, let's stand up so you can be recognized, please. My name is Molly Erickson. I live on the Pine Point Road. I have uh, two issues I want to bring up. Uh, the first is the hockey rink. I think it's a great idea. But uh, two things, I agree with the gentleman. It should not be in Oak Hill. We have lots of different areas we can put it. Also, I know that they're looking, they're hoping to get a low cost uh, lease from the town and I just hope you don't do that. We shouldn't be giving uh, anyone a break on lease land. 
if you want to do that, then lower everyone's taxes. How's that for a break? Um, more, more people would benefit from that. Um, the second thing I wanted to address is uh, I, I often get the feeling that there are people in the town who have their own vision for the town and nobody else gets really to say any part of it. Um, I think what the woman said earlier about apathetic voters is true. I wish we had more people who were involved in the town. Um, I, I'm talking specifically about the big renovation plan and rejuvenation plan for the Dunstan area. And um, in the article in the in the leader, you talk about um, the eventual result of this gradual change will be a modern and active mixed-use neighborhood. I can tell you, I live in Pine Point, and I don't want a mixed-use neighborhood. So please, do it somewhere in, at Dunstan. Don't start coming down to Pine Point. I just want a neighborhood. I don't want boutiques and coffee shops in every single neighborhood in Scarborough. I think it would be nice just to have a plain old neighborhood. And I think to have this big uh, revision of Dunstan Corner and put in roads and a little mini Route 1 on the back side, like people have talked about, is absurd. Um, and I think if, if you told more people what was in the works, I like to think that more people would come out because I don't think a lot of people want their neighborhood to be turned into a mixed use zone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if you'd like to speak, you have to go up to the mic. No. Turn. Yep. Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, the council is set to up, uh, take up the a cell tower ordinance and uh, an overlay map tonight, and you will be making a decision, if you make a decision, about hundreds of people's property without even notifying them that you're changing their zone, that you're actually changing their residential zone by permitting an industrial use. In my heart, I know that's wrong. And in your hearts, I think you know that's wrong. Whether it's legally wrong, well, that's up to the lawyers and the courts to decide, isn't it? But I know it's wrong because people work hard and invest in their homes as safe havens and financial investments. They have a right to know when decisions about their private property are being made. And that is why the state has a law, MRSA Title 30A, Section 4352, which requires that a town notify any person whose property is going to be changed if they're in a residential zone and they're going to be permitting an industrial zone. I'm sure there's all kinds of legal arguments why we may or may not be following that. But in my heart, and I think in your heart, you know what the intent of that law was, and that is to protect private property. You know, oftentimes courts review these things. They appeal decisions made by municipalities. They look at the intent of the law. They don't just look, because that's why we have two, argue, two lawyers looking at it. Right now, it could be argued that towers are currently prohibited in residential zones. Well, yes, except there's that special exception. But I know the intent is very clear. Your sole responsibility as land use regulators is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of citizens and that includes property values. And nothing in the Telecom Act, nothing, preempts your jurisdiction on that responsibility. And despite 704's limitations for environmental effects for our us, you can deny a tower, you cannot deny a tower. This is not an application you're doing. You're doing an overlay zone, you are doing zoning, and you can consider health effects because that is your sole responsibility as our elected officials to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our community. And we are asking you to do that. I drove around my house um, this weekend and I took screenshots for four days in all the different locations of some of the overlays over by Prout's Neck and Pine Point where my friends, I listened to, I watched NPR news, I um, texted people, I made phone calls. There's no gaps in coverage. At least they're not significant. They're not substantial. There are no gaps in those two overlay zones. Maybe there are on the other side of the turnpike. There probably are. I can't, I can't speak to that. But what I'm saying is, if you guys decide this without notifying people, you're making the decision um, you're rushing into it. There's a lot of good ideas 
that could be on the table if you took your time and did the work and you did it for the benefit of the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ace Holton. Uh, I'm on Snowberry Drive. And I'd like to speak briefly about the mem memorandum of understanding for the uh, hockey arena. Uh, I, I think it, they've done a great job in planning, <coughs> planning a hockey <coughs> arena, they all except one thing. They hope and pray that the town will give them some of their parking spaces in the town municipal area. They want, the first proposal was to dig up the parking lot right behind us. Another proposal would be another parking lot maybe by the tennis courts. I've heard different rumors of where it might be located. We just got through bonding Wentworth School for $39 million. I don't have any idea how much of that was for the new parking lot in front of it. But I want to believe that those spaces were needed. If they were needed for the existing use of the complex, then there are no parking lots left to be destroyed that we are still paying for. So I, I think giving away space or renting space, which reduces the parking, would be a very poor idea. The alternative might be to fill in more land behind the football field or to find perimeters or beside the park or whatever. But why take apart things that we spent big money for to develop? The arena will be used 17 hours a day. There will be traffic in and out every hour for 17 hours. That's what they're saying. They're going to rent it for 17 hours a day. And the school right now is pretty busy with uh, activity with parking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Good evening. My name is uh, Jeff Jones. I live at 14 Acorn Lane, but I'm here tonight as Jones and Warren representing the Proud Snack Community Organization. And we want to talk about the first item on the agenda, which is the uh, proposed zoning amendment for the wireless towers and facilities. And we, we do support the effort and progress that's been made in this regard, and we do acknowledge the need for better wireless coverage in Scarborough. <coughs> but we have three proposed changes that we would recommend and believe, we believe would strengthen the zoning ordinance and amendment. The first is we believe that the applicant, the amendment should have a performance standard for the applicant to show that the transmission tower would, do, would not have an adverse impact on the environment or wildlife in the area. And we think that that should be the, on the burden of the applicant to show that there would be no negative impact to the environment and local wildlife. The second amendment we would, would require that the applicant upgrade existing towers and existing facilities first before submitting an application to build a new tower so that if Black Point, uh, the tower on Black Point Station can be raised 10 feet to accommodate new antennas, that that should be done before a new tower is built anywhere down in that area. And the third uh, proposal we would have would be to have the applicant show, be required to show the necessity of a tower and to have and allow the zoning board and or the planning board the ability to weigh the impact in relation to the population density in the area to be served so that they can do a balancing test as for the necessity and the need of a tower vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 uh, the population of the area to be served and the density of the population. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Gina Chrissy, One Metalwood Drive at Scarborough. Um, I just have a couple issues I just want to mention real quickly. First of all, I do appreciate all the thought and consideration that is going into planning placement of cell towers, but 
as was said earlier, I really hope that you do remember that your primary priority should be the health, welfare, property values of your townspeople that you represent. And I urge you not to make any hasty decisions that it needs to be tabled, table it. This is an issue that probably shouldn't have even come this far. As was also said earlier, existing towers should be improved upon and boosted to see if what that does for reception. There are other measures that should be taken before we even consider placing new towers. And any citizens that are going to be impacted by zoning changes should definitely be informed of any such changes, especially since I believe I'm going to be one of those citizens. Um, and as far as the hockey rink goes, you know, I am I love skating. I'm all for having a rink in town, <coughs> but I I do really hope that if if a facility is built, that it's a facility that does have multiple uses, not strictly as a hockey rink. You know, so that everyone in town can benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing no one else, I'll close the public hearing. <coughs> General comments. <coughs> Minutes of October 1st, 2014. With approval? Second. Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. <coughs> Adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Okay. I treasurer's warrants. They are here. I'll sign them as the meeting goes on. Under old business order number 1453 is the second reading on the proposed changes <clears throat> to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to create a transmission tower overlay district and to update the performance standards thereto. This item had been tabled from the September 17, 2014 Town Council meeting. Okay, Dan, will, uh, the Town uh, Planner will go over this briefly. And uh, we've had uh, two workshops on this, and it's... Uh, been out to the public for I think two weeks now. So um, we'll have Dan go over the highlights of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you mentioned, I've just been before you a number of times now. Um, <coughs> we've been working to craft the right wireless and cell tower standards for Scarborough. Um, last Thursday evening, <coughs> October 9th, um, the, this council had a very comprehensive workshop on the latest proposal. Um, and this latest proposal is a much stricter and more specific proposal than what was passed by the council at first reading back in early summer in June. Um, and this proposal that was reviewed last Thursday has a stepped priority process, um, as mentioned uh, at, during comments a few minutes ago, encouraging and requiring existing towers to first be examined for adding antennas and then applicants can move to new towers within industrial zones um, as the second preferred approach, and then move to, um, to telecommunication facilities, which are antennas on top of buildings, to, to provide uh, more stealth and uh, screened antennas. And then lastly, consider um, new towers in the overlay district, which was presented to you uh, last Thursday, which is a more specific, limited, uh, area in the community uh, in the rural and residential zones where, where towers would be allowed as the, a last option. Um, at the conclusion of your workshop last Thursday, the council provided some additional direction to, to staff um, and to further refine the proposal that was reviewed on Thursday. So I wanted to kind of touch on what has been updated since that Thursday proposal, uh, last week's proposal, and um, review those additional changes uh, given where we are at this point. And so in your packages that were provided um, to you last Friday, as well as pub available for the public last Friday, uh, there's the proposed amendment dated October 10th, um, which is Friday's version. And there's also a memo that highlights uh, what those changes are. So one of the, I'm just going to quickly walk through the memo and then 
motion to turn it back to the council. One of the changes to, was to give the planning board more discretion on transmission tower height um, to give the board the ability to actually reduce the, the allowed tower height. Um, right now it's proposed to be 130 feet um, and there's a change on page three that it would allow the planning board to um, see photo simulations or balloon tests of where a tower uh, would be on a site and give the board the ability to actually require the, the height of the tower to be less, to be uh, less visible from abutting properties, abutting roadways, um, abutting uh, public spaces. So that's a change to give the planning board more tools and discretion in that regard. Another thing that was brought up at the workshop last week was to give the planning board, again, more discretion and flexibility on requiring a larger setback than the version uh, presented Thursday. And so that language has been added into uh, the proposal to give the planning board the ability to require up to a 300 percent uh, of the tower height setback in, within the overlay. And that's something the council was looking for, um, again, to, to even provide more separation from abutting properties and, and views, et cetera. On pages four and five, uh, we added some language to uh, give the planning board more authority to require um, key landscaping and vegetative screening to be placed in the easement so that it can't be changed in the future. Because um, in some sites there could be trees and, and corridors along a roadway that are integral to, um, to buffer the, the tower. So it gives the board the ability to protect those, those corridors and those, uh, that vegetation um, while the tower is in existence. On page five, uh, the council had expressed some concern about kind of the visual impact review process and making sure um, the planning board had enough discretion to require a visual impact assessment and then require adjustments in where facilities are located on, on large properties. Um, so that language was improved to, to make it clear that that visual assessment happened first and then the planning board can instruct the applicant to adjust the tower location, tower height, tower buffering to, again, to, to screen these as, uh, as extensively as, as possible. Another addition is a uh, requirement for public notification for any applications that go to the planning board or the zoning board for review. Uh, that was added to the language to make it clear that uh, when an application is submitted, that abutters within 500 feet of um, a proposal are notified as to when that application is going to to which board and, and the agenda for that meeting. Um, and lastly, on page eight, uh, the council was interested in having the planning board play a role in the review of any uh, wireless facility that's proposed. Um, so. We've added language to the proposal that um, gives the planning board a step in, a, in a, a review period and recommendation to the zoning board before an application goes to the zoning board. There are some telecommunication facilities that would, the zoning board would be the primary review authority, but this adds that the planning board also participates in the review. It's, it would be a two-step process. Um, given the, the planning board's familiarity with these types of applications that was requested to the council. Um, so that's an overview of what's been updated since your workshop. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the version that includes all those changes is the October 10th uh, version that you may want to work off of once you're um, discussing this matter and uh, the version that's provided at your seats also has a effective date of November 15th that was asked by the council to have this not take effect immediately to give the planning board the ability to have a, a workshop to review their administration of, of this ordinance and get familiar with it in case there are applicants that come forward in the near future. Um, so that's been added. And the planning board has scheduled a workshop or before their next meeting um, to take up the matter. So that, that is in the works and they will be they will be doing that should the council 
um, adopt some version of this this evening. So um, with that introduction, I'm certainly going to be here for questions and comments as the meeting and discussion continues. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> okay, public comment on Order 1453. Anyone would like to speak to this order? Cell phone ordinance. Three minutes. Name and address, please. Uh, Julie Tupper, Spurwink Road, in Scarborough. Um, your sole responsibility as land use regulators is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of citizens. This includes property values. Nothing in the Telecom Act preempts your jurisdiction <coughs> on that responsibility. How many of you on the council, um, or on the planning board for that matter, have read the Cell Tower book by Blake Levitt? Did you know that there are solid case laws that says communities can set specific signal strengths, i.e. lower in vehicle versus higher in dwelling, for instance, and more case law that recognizes towns can write superior RF safety regulations. That means going above and beyond for the greater good of the community. There was a recent Wall Street Journal piece on how many towers are out of compliance, even with the high thermal base regulations. No one monitors. When was the last time the towers in Scarborough were monitored, and to whom do they report? The town may assume that you have to bring 100% coverage to town. However, you don't. You may think you cannot consider health environmental effects at all. However, you can within certain limits. And the town may think that they cannot be held accountable, which it can. How many of you are aware that there could be grounds for a lawsuit with commission members named individually? because of creating a blanket regulation for the entire town that involves exposures to a non genotoxin RF. The same is true for churches and private landowners that lease space to telecom providers. There is no status of limitation on health claims and EMF damage. Everyone with a stake in siting decisions can be sued if adverse effects turn up. We know the town can't unreasonably discriminate am among providers, but towns can, and usually do, require co-location on existing tower. That is reasonable discrimination. Even if a carrier argues that they want a better location, the town is not, to, not required to provide the carriers the absolute best location, just a reasonable one. If another carrier is already providing service from an existing location, then it is probably good enough. The town can also require monitoring to make sure that all facilities meet the maximum FCC emissions guidelines, no matter how many providers are co-located on a particular site. Typically, very few people at the location level, uh, at the local level, understand that the responsibility for compliance monitoring has shifted to munif municipalities. Great Barrington, Massachusetts, was one of the first communities in the country to incorporate the requirements for RF engineering detail, as well as thorough monitoring and proof of liability coverage for the town into zoning regulations. This has been used by many communities as a template since. Blake Levitt has been thoroughly entrenched in this for years and has assisted many communities put together reasonable protections. The consultant that was hired for Scarborough was a third party but worked for wireless industry. Blake, Indus Blake Levitt is also a third party consultant but works for herself and for communities that want to do the right thing for the health and safety of their citizens. You owe it to us to use the resources available that will gain us the best result while not being sucked into who works for the industry. Know your rights as a community when setting forth. In conclusion, start by increasing the height of the towers in the industrial zones. Live with that for a period and then reevaluate. You will be surprised how doing that much will affect the, the gap. Don't do more than is needed. Baby steps, please. Gaps in coverage that are not significant or substantial can be filled with putty, not a whole coating of mud on the town. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Laura Hannon from 17 Powderhorn Drive. And uh, like Julie, I think we should do baby steps. I mean, Raising the height of the towers, existing towers, would be a great way to start. Um, I do think the towers should stay in the industrial areas and out of the residential and rural farming areas. Um, I'm opposed to the stealth towers or mini towers on top of utility poles. Um, I think this all needs to stay in the industrial areas. 
and we really need to, you know, work slowly here because I'm concerned about, you know, health effects, environmental effects, property values. Um, there's just a whole range of, of issues here. So I really urge you to be careful and, and think long and hard about this decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, so I'm crossing my fingers that you'll postpone this because we've got a lot of people who have already just presented great ideas with you, and I know that I, I've talked with at least four of you counselors and provided some information as well. Um, I heard Dan say at least about 10 changes since the public hearing. That's only for one workshop, 10 changes. This is not the same ordinance that was heard at the public hearing. This is a whole new ordinance. <clears throat> Some might even argue that it's a new ordinance and should go to public hearing. Again, I'm going to reiterate that you're making decisions on people's properties who have not even been notified. Um, I started to say that I took pictures of my phone, which is Verizon. I forgot to tell you, I got a friend also to take pictures. She has AT&T. She went down to Pine Point also and got some photos of her service and where she is. Um, there's no significant gaps with her phone is, uh, either. And one of my suggestions is to require that the applicant must show there are significant or substantial gaps. They must prove that before any towers are considered. All of these changes that are being made are great and they're really, really good, but you're not done yet. <clears throat> Your job is to protect us. You are the municipal body to do that. And you can do that by slowing this ordinance down to get it right, hiring a Blake Levitt as an outside consultant to, to get it right. Um, all, there's other ways. Um, maybe there's going to be amendments. Um, made. But to push this through when it's not completed and when we're not really confident because there's an election coming up is really irresponsible. Julie mentioned the fact that uh, one out of every five tower is not in FCC compliance. And that's correct. And not only that, 11 workers have already died on towers. Um, thus far in 2014, and according to OSHA, at 13 died in 2013. Uh, they're having, actually, tonight, they're having a webcast, OSHA is, about how they can prevent some of these deaths. There's a lot to this cell tower stuff. Baby stuff is exactly what should be taken, not this overall approach. And so I urge the council to please consider postponing this decision until you get planning board input more citizen input, and perhaps even your own amendments. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My argument is to be a 10 page page. Liam Summers, Holmes Road. Um, this council spent uh, nearly 12 months in deciding um, ordinances that would protect a sparse population of shorebirds uh, and make sure that they were safe. Uh, and in doing so, uh, many of you came back and said, we rushed some of those decisions, and we wish we could have taken that back, and we wish we could have um, had a do-over. Now you're faced with a decision that affects the health and welfare of your entire population of citizens and wildlife as well. This is your chance for the do-over. This is your chance to be thoughtful <coughs> and take a moment and step back and say, let's not rush this decision. Let's get this one right. So uh, I urge you to do that. Reflect on what you said coming out of that uh, Plover debacle and where you said, I wish we could do that over. I wish we had that to go back and be more thoughtful. And apply that here. You have that opportunity now. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on any of the medical uh, effects of RF, but I'm not sure that you guys are either. And that's something that we should take our time with so that we don't end up with lawsuits and, and issues down the road. Take the time. Be thoughtful. Nobody's uh, cell phones are going anywhere. And, and you won't have to come out of this decision saying, I wish we had a do-over. So thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> I'm on road near 14 Street. So I'm the friend that Suzanne was talking about. And um, so when I am on the beach, 
um, I can uh, get online, I can, re on Pine Point Beach, I can uh, get online, I can receive phone calls, I can make phone calls, I can download <coughs> music, I can do everything on the beach where there's no cell towers. Um, and I can do it in my house. I've, I've never had a problem there. I went up by the marsh because oftentimes by the marsh it will go dead, but I did it for three days in a row and I, I always got whatever I needed to do. So I don't know that you know we need as many as they say we need. We might need some in other areas, but um, I just think that we need to just be careful of how many we are getting. And that's all. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Do I have a motion? Uh, I'll move uh, adoption of the amendment that was approved at the first reading. I have a second. Second. Discussion. <clears throat> Are you the first reading? Yeah. Or the document in oh. front of us? Yeah. Councilor Donovan, uh, <clears throat> we've come a long way from uh, the first reading, months of work, many hearings. Uh, we have before us an October 10th document, and I think to procedurally place this matter properly before the town council at this time, that it would be appropriate, and I will make a motion uh, to amend, uh, to replace the first reading uh, draft with the October 10th, 2014 draft distributed uh, to us and the public last Friday. Okay, so you've made a motion to replace the original draft with the October 10th draft. Do I have a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Discussion. Council Benedict. I don't want to put a wet blanket on this, but I find in getting a 10-page handout that I have not had available ample time to sit down and read word for word that there's no way that I'm in a position to do a affirmative <coughs> vote on this. And I turn around on page four and just citing one of the problems I have is we had discussed the 25-acre parcel. Didn't agree to it, but we're discussing that. And now I read in here, minimum lot size from 25 acres to a minimum of five acres and a setback difference equivalent to 150% of the total tower height. That's not been any part of our discussions as I remember. And I, I don't like I don't like changes being crept up crept up and jammed down my throat. I am uh, not comfortable with that at all. And until I have the time to read a ten page document, which is not going to be in the next fifteen minutes, I'm gonna vote no for it. <coughs> Um, Tom, when was this prepared? Well, I think what mm -hmm. Councillor Benham is looking at, and I have the, the privilege of being able to look over his shoulder, is the, the draft that was provided to you tonight. Substantively, it is exactly the same as the one produced and distributed on Friday. So there's no changes. The only difference is uh, it's clean. It's accepted all the changes. So uh, I would just uh, point out that uh, though it, there hasn't been a lot of time for review, it's certainly not been provided to you first time this evening. Um, Right, I received it on Friday also, and I mean, I had the weekend and until tonight to go through it. Uh, this, it this is the first time I've seen anything between tw about 25 acres and going down to five. I don't remember any time that that was part of any. Well, I assure you, staff has taken no liberties. Anything in this document has come uh, from this council, and we've, we've uh, done our best to draft and capture those thoughts, but we've not taken any liberties to add any elements to this ordinance.
Okay, Jessica. Uh, Council I Holbrook. Might just add that. Um, I do remember that it was a product of the workshop, and if you might recall, at the end of the workshop, um, Tom had been taking notes on things that we had a general consensus to, and was going to incorporate what those items were into the document you have in front of you, and that is what was released on Friday. Um, the more singular items that there wasn't a consensus on, he, he as far as I know, has worked with individual counselors on, um, but but there was a little kind of consensus that there were a certain number of items and he did go over them. Um, one of those was the 25 acres. That was something that I had actually brought up. Um, what that allows for is, um, especially uh, in the RF districts, is these are, again, rural farms, especially around my area. Um, the initial startup to put a tower on site is 25 acres. However, after that, person that owns the property would have the ability to still utilize that property maybe for an accessory building like another barn or, or those sorts of activities. So it only, the, the goal was to guarantee the 25 acres initially, but if someone so chooses to use it after, it shrinks to five acres around the site. Um, so again, if that helps you any, um, that, that was something that was <laughs> actually came from me. Um, but if that adds any clarity. Um, <clears throat> talk about the document now, or I can come back to me. I don't care. Um, I think it's uh, Council St. Clair was next. Um, I have an amendment, but it's not the time for that, I guess. Right. We're talking about, I, I, I am not going to support this as it is. I'll save my comments for, um, in a couple of minutes, but I, I'm not comfortable with the way that this is written, um, and I don't, I don't think we're ready. We're, I don't think we're there yet. Okay, um, Councilor Katarina, did you have something? Nothing at the moment. Okay, Councilor Donovan. I just wanted to make a procedural comment so that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, the motion to amend to adopt the October 10 uh, draft uh, distributed to the public and to ourselves last week uh, uh, is to make it the main motion, uh, not to adopt the main motion. Uh, if people wish to make amendments uh, uh, to the main motion after the October 10 uh, draft uh, is, uh, uh, if it's passed, becomes the main motion, that would then follow this uh, this point in the proceeding. I just wanted to make sure no one was confused. I don't think we're confused. I think we're pretty clear. <clears throat> okay. Discussion. Council Benedict. Uh, Blaze. You all know that I've always been in favor of just raising tower heights. It's my opinion that we, that's what we should do. Mm -hmm. Raise the tower heights in the industrial zones to 200 feet, allow co-location, end of discussion, put it into place, and then deal with it from there. Um, every day that goes by, more and more information comes about that I feel very, very uncomfortable about. Um, I want to hear how the planning board feels about this. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what the planning board wants to set up uh, as far as uh, standards are concerned. Um, I was going to make some amendments tonight, but I'm not going to make any amendments. I'm not going to. I'm not going to vote for this. We're not ready. We are not ready to turn this on. Um, we're not, we're not doing our job. I'm sorry, but uh, that's how I feel. Okay. Councilor Caterina. All right, now I'll say something. Um, I feel that we are ready to move forward on this. I know that there are some amendments that people have suggested that I would be willing to discuss and work on um, with this um, document. I will remind the public that this has been on the Ordinance Committee 
since March of 2013. Um, it's been discussed, hashed, rehashed. Uh, we've had workshops. Uh, we've gotten input. We've gotten emails from people, both pro and con. Uh, and frankly, I support moving forward with this. So that's where I am with amendments. Okay. Any, anyone else? Anyone else? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Amendments. I can scroll down. Yep. Are there any amendments to this? I don't bring forth this amendment. I'm going to lose it anyway. Hmm? I don't bring forth this amendment. I'm going to lose it anyway. Cute. Uh, Council Sinclair? Um, I feel like I'm not, in, I don't, I'm not, com I'm mm -hmm. not feeling comfortable with this at all, but um, the amendment that I'm looking at um, and I'm open to discussion uh, was, was drafted today, so it ha not, a lot of you have had time to look at it, and obviously the public has not had time to look at it. Um, <clears throat> but where I'm going with it is basically, I'm not going to read this entire thing, um, but number one, it completely gets rid of stealth, stealth areas in town. There, I, I don't want there to be stealth. Um, that whole wording uh, makes me extremely uncomfortable. And also I asked um, them, staff, to prepare this with um, no more of the boxes on top of the telephone poles. I'm not comfortable with that either. I, I'm afraid that those are going to end up um, near our residential areas or in our residential areas, um, and we're not going to even know it. And I don't. I think that's unacceptable. And I would use the word sneaky. So that is my amendment. I feel like if I don't put forth this amendment, even though I'm uncomfortable with going forward with this, that this amend that this amendment is not going to get in, and that's a problem in itself. <clears throat> so I feel like I don't have any other choice except to bring this amendment forward at this time. So, kind of point of order. So at this point, you've moved your motion for an amendment. Please, and I will second for the purpose of discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, who can explain yeah, if I could add some further clarity, and, and Dan certainly knows more about it, but essentially to accomplish what <coughs> Councilor St. Clair articulated, which is to remove stealth and any opportunity for antenna uh, systems, if you will, on the top of utility poles, uh, we proposed a comprehensive amendment that would effectively remove telecommunication facilities uh, from the ordinance altogether, and that's what this ordinance amendment does. Dan, I don't know if you can offer further clarity. Yeah, and just to, to, to build on that. Um, telecommunication facilities are defined as the wireless antennas that are attached to a building or structure or pole, as Councillor um, St. Clair has commented on a t telephone pole in the, in the instance she was talking about. Um, so that's what a telecommunication facility is, an antenna attached to something else. And that's been considered itself because they could be on top of a roof of an office building or in a church steeple or things of that nature. Um, they're currently allowed in town in a more limited way than the proposal would allow for it, meaning that right now telecommunication facilities are allowed on municipal properties, municipal buildings, and also places of worship. Um, the town uses telecommunication facilities for some of its own communication, not necessarily wireless um, communication that the carriers would be interested in. Um, so that's what a telecommunication facility is, and the amendments that uh, Councilor St. Clair are offering would strike in the entire um, October 10th proposal all telecommunication facilities. So it wouldn't be allowed um, in any zones and wouldn't be allowed in, in any context, um, and that would eliminate uh, what she's concerned about. I have a question. Um, go, go ahead, uh, Council Benedict. Dan, if uh, you could answer for me, we were discussing 
at the last meeting workshop about having antennas on top of the electric lines. Um, Transmission lines? Yeah, I'm not quite clear what they were. But they were going to be placed up like mm -hmm. along. Yeah, there's two different opportunities for that. One is on the high voltage transmission lines, the taller yep. poles um, for transmission lines. And then there's the other opportunity, uh, which is on the, the regular distribution utility poles. You know, the, the poles are more widespread within the community that provide power to houses, power to neighborhoods. So both of those antennas attached to either of those would be considered telecommunications facilities in the zoning ordinance. So by striking the allowance for telecommunications facilities, you're prohibiting both of those scenarios. Okay, because there are Blueberry Lane, um, Thunder Road, Rock Turn Road goes under the wires, I believe. Yeah. So we're, we're cutting off our nose despite our face as far as keeping them out of RF, dist RF districts. If, if, if they went along, I'm just supporting the same thing of no stealth. Because if they're, if they're put in there on the lines, that's not doing the people any favors moving in there. I mean, it would seem that people would know when they bought the house or whatever that, yes, they're there. But I don't believe that that's necessarily true to try and figure out what someone's going to know going into a house. Um, so I would support the amendment with no additions in that particular situation. Okay, any comments? I'll, I'll comment. Um, I, I do greatly appreciate what Councillor St. Clair is doing, although I don't oh. agree with it in its entirety. Um, I do believe you'll find there is likely to be another amendment this mm -hmm. evening that, that does have some similarities to it. Um, so in the event that this one doesn't pass, I think you might find that you could support the upcoming amendment. Um, for me, I, I do agree. I, I think it has little uh, D, DNAS or whatever, the, the, the pole antennas. Um, I do support getting rid of those. I don't think they do. I think they're unsightly. Um, certainly following down, you know, poles into neighborhoods and stuff, that, that's likely not, not a good place for them, like I said, um, especially where the town has done um, some pretty extensive work over the last years at moving away from utility poles and, and going everything, being underground and, and trying to get underground wiring. So again, um, I, I can appreciate, you know, moving away from some of that technology. However, I do think there is a place for um, stealth antenna on the high transmission lines. I, I think that there is an application there for it. Um, I, I know stealth is kind of a, a not nice word for it, but I wish it was called something else. However, I, I do believe that I can only take into consideration the visual impacts of something and the arguments of, you know, it's an eyesore and how much it could depreciate the value. Th those, those tools are, are how you mitigate those issues. And I would hate to lose those tools. You know, again, if you can put it into steeples, you no longer have the eyesore. Um, you know, so again, I, I don't support it on the other end. There, there's half of your amendment that I do support, and then I think you'll find that there's support enough to at least do the, do the DNS antennas. So um, I won't be supporting it. But. <coughs> Right. Um, my two cents on it is uh, DAS system uh, is, is just a waste of time and money. We lose poles all the time, whether it's a car, um, snow, ice. you know, snow, ice, um, lines go down, power goes out, uh, and so on. Those uh, D DAS, and like you said, they're ugly. And if this um, amendment was only dealing with the DAS. Uh, I'd vote in favor of it also. 
So um, that's just my two cents. Anyone else? Councilor Donovan. Uh, just so you'll know, the DAS is the acronym for systems that sit on the conventional telephone poles. And they just connect uh, uh, from some distance away, pole to pole, and, uh, and it permits you to get signals strength to areas that might not otherwise be reachable. Uh, it's an expensive process. Yeah. It's not favored. We have a big town geographically, so it's, <sighs> it's, it's probably not something that uh, when you think about the uh, move away from above ground structures, municipal structures on our roadways, uh, you can see how that would make some sense. Uh, to throw the whole thing out, the stealth uh, opportunities I think are terrific. They meet our goals of not having a visual impact on the landscape, not uh, 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 being no uh, noticeable and therefore uh, uh, not affecting the property values. Those are the land use planning t tools that we're entitled to control. So I would, uh, I would favor, I don't favor this broader motion, but I would favor one that was more narrowly drawn. Council Holbrook? I have a thought that I forgot about. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, it goes under the tools, too, for me, is there's potential here to avoid construction of a full tower. Again, you know, if we're, we're allowing some application for, for these types of antennas, whether that's transmission lines and, and those sorts of things, you could potentially avoid the need, of immediate need of a full-scale tower somewhere. Um, so again, I'm, I'm trying to be a little cognizant of, you know, I know there's not a lot of warm thoughts about having a ton of towers around, but maybe we can mitigate some issues with a handful of antennas. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Chairman Sullivan. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you mind? Yes. Um, that exact reasoning is why I feel like we're we're pushing. The, I I understand we've had this in front of us for a while, but that exact reasoning is why I still feel like we still need to have more conversations about this. That we're not there yet. We're still like like Councillor Blaze said. We're still getting more information, more data, more facts. I mean, I. I realize that I am the ordinance chair. This was my responsibility. I should have gotten it right the first time, and I should have made sure it was right before I sent it to the full council. I take full responsibility for that. But that being said, um, I can't in good faith. I, I just feel like that's that's my that's the reasoning we're having why we're struggling down on this end with pushing this through, not pushing this through, but moving forward with this because there's still more conversations that need to be had. There's still so many ideas out there. This is not something that I want to see. We have a beautiful town, <laughs> you know, and I don't, I don't want to. We have a beautiful town to protect with a lot of really incredible people in it, including our children. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now, I swear. Um, but I just, that's just why I feel like we're pushing. Okay. Uh, something else down the side? Mm -hmm. Everybody all set? Mm -hmm. More discussion? No, any just more discussion down the side? Okay. Uh, the amendment that uh, Council of St. Clair um, presented uh, has had a second. And all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Is there any further amendments? Yes. Oh, Councilor Caterina. Um, tagging along on this, um, I would like to propose, uh, make a motion to amend subsection 2, standards for telecommunications facilities, by adding a standard B as stated below, and it would be inserted as B, utility poles and transmission lines. For the purposes of these performance standards, telecommunication facilities shall be allowed to be attached or mounted on high voltage public utility transmission line poles and structures subject to Board of Appeals and or Planning Board review and approval, but shall not be permitted to be attached 
or mounted on distribution scale, utility, poles, and structures. Um, and then the subsequent subsections will be renumbered as necessary. That is my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Um, <laughs> the, reason, uh, the reason I, I put this in is uh, I agree with Councillor Holbrook. I think that um, these DAS systems, uh, what I've seen of them, I've done a lot of travel in the United States, spent a lot of time in Chicago with my daughter, and they've got all <laughs> sorts of goofy things on poles out there. Um, I don't want us to see, I don't want to see us going down that road here in Scarborough. Um, I, I would love to see all of our utilities underground, but I know that that's just not going to happen. Um, but we're, as a town with new developments, whatever we're asking, developers put it underground. I just, I don't want to go down this road uh, with a DAS, so that's why I've proposed this. Anyone else? Councilor Donovan. I understand that it's expensive and uh, uh, rarely used and would not be uh, particularly valuable as a tool for us to promote better cell coverage. So uh, I think the, uh, the kind of visual impact outweighs mm -hmm. any possible <laughs> benefits that might arise from this, and so I support it. Council Holbrook. Uh, so I'm just going to say ditto to my previous comments, um, and uh, I'll support the amendment. Um, and I'm just going to say, like I said before, I don't feel that it's a uh, reliable enough um, source to bother with the AS, so um, why, why should we have it in there? Anyone down the sun? No one's that's it, huh? Oh, Jim. Jim. Oh, Jim. Uh, ben, Council Benedict. In conjunction with the, the, the ten page item, this is the first I've seen of this, either one of these items, and where it states in B, utility poles and transmission lines. I guess I'd like to have a clearer idea of where these are. Okay. <clears throat> Would, um, Dan, Dan, can you explain this, please? Uh, the intent behind the amendment that Councillor Katarina offered is to not allow um, wireless antennas on any utility pole or local utility pole that's a distribution for a distribution line, a pole that serves all the electric and phone and all the various utilities throughout the community, um, but to only allow them on the high voltage transmission lines, the, the corridors that you mentioned earlier, uh, Councilor Benedict, out off of Broad Turn Road, there's, a, there's the CMP corridor, those are the high voltage transmission lines and poles. There's also one um, that goes through the Pleasant Hill industrial area. Um, that goes over the connector to 295. So those would be the only areas where, under this amendment, um, antennas could be attached to the poles. They wouldn't be allowed to be attached to any other utility poles in the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Further discussion? With no further discussion, um, there's a motion to amend uh, from Councilor Katarina. It's been seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Further amendments. Are there any further amendments? Councilor Blaze. Uh, I want to make a, an amendment to allow towers in the industrial and light industrial districts to be 200 feet. A second. Okay. I'll make a motion. Discussion. Right. Oh, go ahead. Please, please, please. Please. Can I throw in the second one at the same time? Well, no, one at a time. Okay. But you can do another one in a minute. 
just for the council's benefit, um, at the request of Council Plays, I have prepared this amendment and possibly two others that may be offered. Uh, the first one that he just offered is the first one you see, amendment number one. Okay, I'm sorry. Could maybe Dan just go over this for, for a second? Well, I just thought everybody was touching up on reading this. Um, Dan, could you speak with this one, too, please? I don't have it. Um, Councillor plays out uh, staff I don't have it. I don't have it. an amendment to <laughs> allow for taller towers in the industrial zone, um, and more specifically to treat tower height differently in the industrial zone and light industrial zone than the overlay um, and to allow taller towers up to 200 feet tall in the industrial districts and that's what's shown in these amendments. So it's separating the height for industrial under um, A2 there and it gives the planning board some flexibility, some discretion much like elsewhere in the ordinance where the planning board can uh, require the, the tower to be a bit lower to down to 180 feet um, to minimize or lessen the visual impact of a tall tower and particularly uh, to avoid having the tower have to be lit. Uh, when towers get into the range of 200 feet, um, that's when the FEA uh, typically requires them to be lit, which could be something based on location that uh, the town may want to avoid or planning board may want to avoid, so that gives some flexibility on that upper that upper height and being adjusted down. So I hope that it instills what the what Council Blaze wanted to to yep. achieve with the amendment. I just, I'd just like to make another comment. Yes. Um, I met with Dan and Tom yesterday and discussed this, and I did ask Dan to see if we could get a new uh, PCS coverage map uh, showing a 200 foot tower in the Pleasant Hill industrial mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And now that I think of it, I think we ought to have a 200 foot tower in every industrial area in town and get a new coverage map and see what it looks like for the whole town. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, we shouldn't be voting on this at all until we see something like that. <coughs> Okay. Um, I just I, while Dan's up there, yes. I, I have one question of Dan. With a um, under this ordinance, um, uh, under this amendment, I'm sorry. If you put um, if a tower carrier um, a, was to build a tower in the industrial zone, would this amendment make them build a 200 one, whether they need it or not? What if they said, well, all we need in this zone is uh, 160? This would be the height. 200 feet would be the height limit, so they're Maximum not required height. to build to a certain height. They are required to build a tower that's capable of co-location. That's another uh -huh. requirement elsewhere in the ordinance, so that there's not multiple towers, but they aren't required to build to yeah. 200 if 160, 170 suits their needs and enables co-location and improves but, but here's the here's what the ordinance says. Okay, mm -hmm. I just read this. So, tower shall be, not tower um, up to. It, what I'm saying is, if it says shall be, that to me that would say that they have to build a 200 foot tower whether they need it or not. So, if it said up to, they could go up to 200 feet would make more sense. I, I don't know. It says the height. Sorry. The height limit. It says the height limit earlier in the sentence. It's the height limit, and then shall be. So it's saying that the limit shall be 200 feet. Not the. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Missed the limit. Limit for a new. Okay. All right. That's not a bad idea, though. I didn't say it was. <laughs> really, Mike. It is. It's not a bad idea at all. Okay. 200 feet. We've been told that. Oh. 
I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll go around. To, uh, we had. Uh, oops, I jumped ahead of Bill. Uh, so, Councilor Dan, I, I had a question yes. for Dan. Uh, the amendment is, uh, and it has to do with whether uh, this amendment seeks to add additional industrial zone areas. And maybe you could clarify for us <coughs> what industrial zone areas this particular amendment applies to. Um, this amendment would apply to the two industrial areas that are proposed that currently allow transmission towers. This particular amendment does not add any additional industrial areas. That's could, a different could you, amendment. Could you just clarify for everybody where those are generally located? The current industrial districts that allow for transmission towers under your October 10th version that you're considering are uh, the three industrial districts. One is located at the industrial park off of Route 1 and across from Haggis Parkway. It's a large industrial area. There's an industrial zoned area along Pleasant Hill Road between Route 1 and Highland Avenue. There's an industrial zone off Muzzy Road, um, close to the boundary of South Portland, where Postal Service Way is. And then there's a light industrial area off of Holmes Road, west of the Turnpike in the vicinity of Beechwood Speedway. So those are the four industrial areas currently that, in the proposal, that would allow towers, and we're talking about increasing the height allowance within those under this amendment. Thank you. Council, oh, wait a second. Council St. Clair. We were told that the higher they go, the more, the further out they reach. Right? Wasn't that but something that we were told? I so if we install or build a 200 foot tower, like Councilor Blaze said a couple weeks ago, and that reaches half our town, am I right? I mean... We are told that, yeah, the higher the tower, the further... The further it goes. They, they go. You are also told that there's um, shadowing, topography affects service, so the right. back side of hills in other areas aren't served necessarily because of um, the transmission of... Uh, RF ways, we were told that one tower is not going to have the capacity in terms of um, data and use to serve the entire town. We are told that having one tall tower can interfere with existing shorter towers in terms of um, overlap and drop calls and those things. So <laughs> the benefits of tall which is, towers? Which is basically what we have now anyway, though. I mean, not to be snarky, but I mean... <laughs> The reason that we're here is because we have three small towers in the town that drop calls and aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, so put in a big tower and, okay, I'm done. Um, I think, did Council Blaze, did you have something, another comment? Did, or are you all set for now? I'm all set. Okay. Council Holbrook. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I just have a little bit of clarity? And in, in two minutes, I'm going to give an, a motion to divide into two because he's got two separate amendments. So but give me a minute. Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. We only have one on We're the table right now. We're only looking at page one. He only one. offered one. I thought he offered the package. No, no, no. We've been able to talk about then that when one. Then when you yeah. get to the second page, <laughs> well, uh, that's amendment. That's amendment. Uh, yeah. Separate. It is separate now. Okay, yeah. I thought it was a package, <laughs> so I'm glad. No, I'm really. All right, never mind. I reserve my bite my tongue and pull my. <laughs> Councilor Donovan, uh, you know, uh, Ed's been talking about this for a long time, and he and I've talked about it a lot. And uh, uh, maybe I'm just slow to the to the party, but I've really come to believe that they're in the industrial zone. Higher towers make sense. Uh, I think in the Pleasant Hill <coughs> Industrial Zone, a 200-foot tower, which we are told there is a reasonable chance there will be a tower in there, could 
uh, overcome some of the shadowing effects uh, that uh, plague coverage at Higgins Beach, where I live. Drop calls occur all the time. It's very, very poor coverage there. You can't drive up Morning Street. You can't drive up Besser Street without if you're a Verizon customer and not have drop calls. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a real problem. So a 200-foot tower there, I think, is uh, an opportunity to cover an area of the town that might not otherwise get any coverage since it's stuck on the Cape Elizabeth line. Uh, and it's sort of in the corner of the town. So uh, I think it's a good idea, and I'm going to support this, uh, this amendment. Okay. Uh, Councilor Katerina. Uh, I also have um, given some thought to this, um, and for all the reasons mentioned previously, I would support Councilor Blaze's amendment here also. Okay, Councilor Benedict. Uh, Dan, I had a question for you. If you have, if you can answer it, what is the difference in mileage between a 150-foot tower and a 200-foot tower? In coverage? So can't answer it. That's uh, five, and we'll see. Uh, that would have been a good question. <laughs> I can answer that. Okay. Ed has it. 150, 150, 12 and a quarter miles radius, 200 feet, 14.14 miles radius, or 628 square miles versus 471 square miles. That's a lot of coverage for one tower. Right, but um, Ivan cautioned us also. I, I know. No, no, I'm, 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 dead. I'm just, just answering saying of, question. of taller towers. Um, attracting more phones and overloading the tower. That's, that's you know, it, I'm not disagreeing with, I think it's a good idea mm -hmm. to at least have that option on the table. We may be able to eliminate, um, but, you know, towers, some, uh, you know, extra towers. So, um, Council Holbrook, did you have No, let's go. Uh, is everyone all set down this end? Anything else? Nothing? Nothing? All right. Um, all right, on we have um, Council Blaze's amendment to uh, raise the tower height to 200 in industrial zones. We have a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, do we have any further amendments? Yes. Council of Blaze. This is pretty much the same as the previous one, except uh, I guess in the ordinance, stated 1010, the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District, uh, there's an amendment in there saying the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District to delete transmission towers is permitted as a permitted use. And what I'm saying is, stick it back in. It's an industrial zone. Stick it back in for a 200-foot limit. That's the amendment. Okay. Do we have a second? Second for purpose of discussion. Okay. Discussion. Anything further you want to add to it, Council Blaze? No. Council Katerina. Um, I would not support this, and the reason I would not support this is if you know anything about the industrial overlay zone down in Pine Point, think of Snow's Canning. Uh, and if you put a tower in Snow's Canning, there's this nice little rise in the road that comes down, and there's a nice visual view there, and I would hate to see uh, towers there for that reason alone. Um, and it wouldn't be moving you away from residential per se. There's a lot of residential down there. And then the third reason is um, as part of our comprehensive plan and looking at um, you know long-term planning for the, for this town, we're kind of moving away from having an industrial zone there. I'm not saying it's being eliminated, but I'm just saying some changes to it to make it a little. Uh, fit in better with the uh, Pine Point area. 
So that's why at this point I would I would not support this amendment. Any further discussion? Councilor Donovan. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Councilor Katarina's uh, comments, but I really want because I just think that uh, uh, that is a highly visible area. Uh, <clears throat> but more so, I think the, the way the overlay districts were drawn was to look at those areas where there was the poorest coverage and play, uh, allow for the placement of towers in those locations and in very close proximity to the um, Pine Point Road Industrial uh, uh, District is the area that on the southern end of the community that has been designated as a part of the overlay district. Uh, and it is more sheltered, more protected, very large lots, and therefore <clears throat> I think there's a redundancy to add uh, the uh, Pine Point Industrial District uh, and, uh, and this is much closer to the mapping that we got from our consultants mm -hmm. as to the kind of problem we were trying to solve uh, by, by forcing the location of towers into certain places. Thank you. Anyone else? And I also um, agree with Councilor Donovan. I would um, say that we've got an overlay already close to that that's going to be protected. I meant you won't see the tower and uh, that yeah, uh, putting it down the Pine Point Industrial Area just, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me, but um, with all due respect. So um, I won't be supporting that. Um, anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we have an amendment um, to uh, presented by Council of Blaze to add Pine Point industrial zone to allow cell phone towers. And we have a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Council St. Clair didn't see Council her Council St. Clair? Which, which way? Vote it down. Okay. okay. <coughs> All right. Is there any further <coughs> amendments? <coughs> Council Blaze. Yeah. This is brand new to everybody, but it, it's been mentioned tonight. Uh, somewhere in here, we've got to add a little verbiage that puts responsibility on the wireless company that's coming to us to either uh, put up a tower or uh, install some sort of uh, telecommunications facility in town. They have to prove to us prove to us that there's a substantial or significant gap in coverage. And it's got to be, it can't be, well, we know it is, you know, da 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 da. We've got to see figures. I mean, we have people in town here that go around uh, that are testing coverage themselves, and it's different. You take a look online and you take a look at these uh, cell uh, companies' coverage reports for Scarborough. Great coverage for Scarborough. That's great coverage for Scarborough. What are we doing here tonight? So we have to have definite proof. Now, I don't know how you want to word that, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just really two words significant or substantial gaps in coverage. Prove it. In in what kind of coverage? Is this data or written up, ver no. verbal or? Well, it's got to be in the. Uh, I mean, because data and verbal are two different coverage. I mean, he tried to mix, put them together in the map that he gave us. There's, I believe, four different band frequencies. Well, they've got a, a gap. Is a gap. Okay. They don't have coverage for voice or data 
or internet, whatever it is, okay. prove it to us. All right. Well, I'm saying. Dan, can you stop? Were you finished? I, I thought. Yeah. I, okay. Um, I think I kicked you. Just to add, uh, Councillor Blaze's comments, there is a section in the October 10th version that's been yeah. in past versions as well that does cover, that does deal with coverage under I. And the, that's the intent of that section. Turn to page six. Um, there's a requirement that when the applicant comes to the planning board, they do need to produce a coverage analysis showing mm -hmm. existing or planned wireless facilities within t 10 miles of the proposed location that they're considering. And then it goes on to talk about the details of that and indicates the coverage analysis must use um, the, the various frequency bands. Um, that's intended to get at uh, that matter. If there's additional language the council wants to add to that, that's, that's fine, but that's the section that I'd recommend you work within. Mm -hmm. We need, we need some language from to deal with it, and we need a second once you second. tell us what the language is. No, we got to have the language. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he mm. he did that. No. Um. Well, if I read this, as part of the. As part of any proposal, the applicant shall submit a radio frequency coverage analysis showing existing or planned wireless, wireless facilities within 10 miles of the proposed location. That's not, I mean, that's not telling me anything about, is there a gap? Um, I think Council Holbrook has wrote, uh, jotted down kind of what your feelings were and maybe could help you on that. Uh, Council Holbrook. <coughs> I'm going to take a crack. I didn't write it, but I'll take a crack. Uh, at the end of this paragraph where it reads, the coverage analysis must use each current license frequency band by the applicant and a map demonstrating significant gaps in service and coverage. Maybe I got a better idea. I'm open to entertaining. It's a good start. See, I can't come up with something better. <laughs> but I mean, it, at least Maybe it's in there. It's, it's in. It's in there, and then we can turn around and talk to the planning board about coming up with specifics on how to handle it. I'll go with that. Okay, so you'll go with that language. Yep. Okay. You have a motion. <laughs> okay. So did you write it? You read it back? Um, <laughs> you need a motion. We, yeah. um, Council Blaze, would you uh, yield to Councilor Holbrook hmm? to make the motion? Sure. Okay, thank you. Well, you have to, have, to <clears throat> demonstrate. You have to demonstrate that there's a significant gap. That's why I was yeah. They're yielding to you. Oh, me? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor. Blaze has yielded to you to make the motion. Okay. And then we'll do the discussion after the second. He was writing. Can I read over your shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll make a motion to add. I didn't write it. Um, to last month. Hold on. You know it. Would you, like Would you read it for me back okay. again? On the, you, you're adding to the last sentence. The coverage analysis must use each current license okay. frequency band by the applicant and a map demonstrating significant gaps in services and coverage. Must also be. So I'll move that. Okay, second. Anyone second that? Well, I'll second it. Council Blaze. Boy, I said it good the first time. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> <coughs> Councilor Benedict. One of, one of the things that I'm still stuck on, and no one has proved it any different, where, where I live, my neighborhood, we have got two antennas that are supposed to serve. One at the school down Broad Turn Road, and the second one on King's Farm. 
And I can remember back in the beginning of this, where I believe it was a gentleman that's been speaking to us the whole time, <clears throat> and I asked him about the coverage for that area, and he looked right at me and said, that's already been taken care of. We got the best coverage up there. We got no problem. You got the antenna right there. Absolutely a false statement. I can't make a call out of my house, which has no bearing on what we're doing here. But the believability, the accountability, I got a problem with. But somebody tells me, yes, it is. And I stand in my house and go, oh, I got a daughter with an iPhone that's got the same thing. So I don't care if it's an old-fashioned flip phone that I got or a brand new iPhone. The coverage is not anywhere close to good. I mean, i got to go out of my driveway if I don't want to drop a call. And for them from uh, New England Teletel or Verizon, I... I, I sort of forget, because I was very much clouded when I was looked at and told, oh, we've got that all under control. Until I see it, feel it, and stick it behind my ear, I don't want to vote on anything here. I would rather see, as I've said before, they come to us with what they think is necessary and where Right. And prove it. Exactly. So what you're saying is, you said what they when they sold you the phone in the coverage area, it wasn't accurate at all. No, oh, I went through six phones, and I ended up with a thirty dollar policy from Walmart to be the, the best up there, and the uh, best is still nothing. Council St. Clair. No, I no not on this. Thank you. Oh, okay. I I was just. All right. This way, Councilor Katarina. Uh, again, I didn't write it down <laughs> totally, but that's okay. I think the intent, if I, through the chair, could ask whoever's making this motion, it's going to look. All right, well, anyway, is proof is the proof that there's gap in coverage? Is that correct? Is that what you're looking yes. to? Okay, so we need language that addresses that. I'd like to self-admit that I threw a motion on the table just so that there was something to focus a discussion on. Right. You know, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with retracting it if somebody would like to offer something better to address that with. Um, said I, it's strictly for the discussion purpose value. So, hey, Councilor Donovan, uh, I agree with uh, Council Katarina that uh, <clears throat> if you require them to produce a map, right. that doesn't necessarily <laughs> represent a standard. It's just a, a, an element of your application. Uh, so I think you need to have it be framed more as uh, you have to demonstrate it. Uh, you have to, you know, prove is a difficult word because you say, well, what's yeah. the standard of proof? Right. I think ordinances, and Dan probably can tell us better than it, that if an applicant is required to demonstrate something, then the planning board has the ability to uh, take into account whether they feel he demonstrated it or not. Uh, uh, and I, the significant gaps, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, uh, I started trying to write down what we're getting at, which is to show areas of inadequate coverage by this particular applicant. They, they deem that they have inadequate coverage, and they have to demonstrate that. And, and so by focusing on demonstrating uh, and that there are inadequate areas of coverage for which the application is submitted, I think you now are putting their feet to the fire and the planning board has the discretion to decide are they meeting that, that benchmark in allowing the application to be considered for approval. So if Councillor <coughs> Holbrook wants to withdraw her, because it doesn't have a motion, right? a second, right? It does. No, it does have a second. Oh, okay. Council. I would try to t take a crack at 
question? Go for it, Phil. Can I? It was still in the discussion phase. Council St. Clair. I just have to say, I mean, this is this is, more, is this not more proof that we need more time with us? I, you can shake. I see your head, Councillor Katarina. I see it going. I know what you, how you feel. I got it. Okay. But I'm, what I'm saying is, I, I can't believe that we're going to continue to keep voting on this. Ridiculous. Okay. Oh, happily revoke. Well, my amendment. And then Councillor um, Blaze will have to retract his second. second. I'll retract it. Okay, and let's go with Councillor Donovan. Uh, at the end of uh, section uh, I, entitled Coverage, <coughs> Uh, a final sentence uh, would be added. I would move that a final sentence be added that states, uh, an applicant shall demonstrate that there are inadequate, that there is inadequate coverage for the area covered by the application. Second, anyone? Second. second. Council Blaze second that. In discussion? Oh. Council Benedict. It would seem to me that if, if uh, the majority vote wants to turn around and make them show that there is lack of coverage, that by the same token, They've got to show that what they are stipulating to do is going to improve the coverage. And that's what this does. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, yes, you're supporting that amendment. <laughs> right? Okay. I'm supporting the fact that it still is not clear enough. It's still too fuzzy. We've got all these papers all around. I don't believe we're in a position to vote on anything. Okay, there's, we have this in front of us. We have amendments mm -hmm. that already started. Yeah. You, you know, if you, whether this is up and da up or down, it's going to get. It's going. It's being voted on right now. So you know, as we go. So if you have amendments to make this better, then we need to do it now. It may go up, may go down, when we get to that point. Councilor hmm? yeah. yeah. Katarina. Uh, I, I'm satisfied with, with this verbiage because uh, you do have the, um, the element of demonstration, which is so-called proof, um, and the uh, um, cell providers have to show to us. Uh, people of Scarborough, that there's inadequate coverage uh, for the area in which they uh, in which they are proposing the application. So I I could support this. I think it just adds an additional layer that I know people have had some concerns about. I've heard that from folks who in the past. So. Okay. <clears throat> Council Blaze, are you comfortable with that wording? Okay, good. Um, any further discussion down this way? With that, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, to oppose. Is there any further <coughs> amendments? Council of Blaze. I make them. I don't know when I can do this. I don't know. I make a motion that we table this. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. No discussion. Non debatable. You have to have a second. It's non debatable. I second. No discussion. Okay. No discussion? No, straight vote. No. Straight vote. Fine. Okay. Motion the table. 
clarity table to a date certain or just indefinitely, just to be clear? Correct. Right. Definitely. Well, I, I'm not going to put a date on it, that's for sure. I, I'm just wondering what the next step is. Does it go refer to committee or does it come back to the council? There should be some okay. direction as to where it goes. Table it and move it back to the ordinance committee for further work. Okay. Sir, thank you. There's been a motion to table and refer back the ordinance committee. Non-debatable. Uh, uh, there's no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, oh, yeah. We tried. This is our turn. <laughs> okay. Are there any further amendments? Councillor Holbrook. Little tiny one. It's just a little tiny one. If you would go to page eight, and you would go to the bottom under D, which is public notification. And I would like to strike the words within 500 feet of the and replace with abutting. Mm -hmm. Abutting the tower site, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that is in the form of a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, discussion. So if I may? Yes. Um, just to explain myself a little bit, what <laughs> happened was when I was reading this that I was realizing, given the dimensions of the property, something mm. that abuts a tower in the middle of a 25-acre property is right. going to mean you don't actually notify anybody. So right. by changing this verbiage to the abutting property owners, this allows for, for notice to be given on cell phone towers. Yes, very good. Agreed. Is there any further discussion? Mm -hmm. I that. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, Council Holbrook has offered an amendment to uh, change, strike, change the wording from 500 feet to abutters. Okay, it's been seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? One. Are there any further amendments? Okay. There are no further amendments. With that. Okay, uh, we're working off the October 10th um, proposal amendments with. Um, how many amendments now are there? It's trying to get you. It's trying to get your attention. Yes. It was one thing. Okay. And I'm sorry that I forgot it. <clears throat> the on the east side of town there's a yeah. overlay district. This is not the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, here, it was just distributed. Um, there it is. I got it. There was an overlay district along Black Point Road and 77, approximately from Piper Shores. Down to the down through um, Scarborough Beach, and when we took a look at that, there were several neighborhoods in that area, um, and what we wanted to do was just cut that kind of in half, cut those neighborhoods out of there. So it's really the the zone now would be approximately from Scarborough Beach down and from the uh, sanitary district down through the golf course. The, uh, the, what it 
Castle Blaze just described is depicted on the map shown as uh, the third page on that uh, handout I provided. I believe you have it there in front of you. Yes. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, discussion. I'll wait for a minute, I guess. Ready? Council Hopera. Um, so just so we're clear, what this does is it does shrink <coughs> the area down along um, through the Prout Snack area where we had an overlay district and it just kind of tidies it up to the more you know, rural part of that and um, geographically when, when, I, when I first heard the, this concept about shrinking it, I did look and it's more realistic that if a tower was to, to ever come to fruition, it would be more in that area anyway, so I'll plan on supporting it. Mm -hmm. Councilor Donovan. Uh, just so people know what this amendment is seeking to do, it really is trying to pare away the neighborhoods uh, occupied by Marion Jordan Road, uh, for which the previous overlay district went right up to the edge of that. <clears throat> and for those of us who live over there, we call that farm, it's Moorbrook, but it's In God right. We Trust. That's on the sign there where I get my corn and tomatoes right. every day. Uh, and all the way over, not a far distance, but all the way to Atlantic House uh, neighborhood, Kirkwood. Uh, and those are pretty substantial neighborhoods. Uh, and <coughs> so uh, I think it's appropriate to pair it back. I think it's a good idea. It still keeps the spirit of trying to the, the, the coverage gap maps <coughs> that our consultant provided are, are still uh, respected by uh, the revision. And so uh, I think uh, the amendment's a good proposal and I'll support it. Okay. Councilor like Katerina. Um, I also agree uh, with this being pared down. I'm fine with uh, uh, this amendment as proposed by Councilor Blaze. Okay. Anyone down this side? Another good one, Council Boys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Win some, you lose some. I agree with you. That's right. <laughs> you never know if you don't try. Right. Any further discussion? Okay. With uh, We have a second, and we've discussed that. So everyone knows what we're discussing for an amendment. All those in favor? Oh, well, that's first oh, unanimous one. <laughs> okay, I'm glad Breaking you didn't miss that one. There, you almost missed that one. I know. All right. Do we have any further amendments? Further amendments? Okay. With that, um, I started to say we have the October 10th draft in front of us with uh, the amendments from most counselors here. Um, was there any further discussion? Okay, with that. Yeah. It, do you have something? I else? do. Oh, oh, well, I know, let's I get know. it out. I'm going to make it quick, yeah. Um, give me a five minute recess. Um, I, I, I'm <laughs> just going to, I know it's highly unusual that, that we have something that has know quite so many amendments but it's not unheard of no mm -hmm. and I do want to say I think at this point and at this scenario for for what happened this evening was realistically the best outcome that could have happened for this this is a very diverse multi-dimensional issue and again I feel that this was the best place as we did this evening to offer friendly amendments to be in a place that we can reasonably agree to to try to take on as a document. Um, the other thing I think I'd, I'd just like to mention is um, you know, as much as you know, the planning board might be a nice place, and I do value their opinion. They do work under us, 
and I view this document as the policy of things and what we want to happen, and I'm leaving it up to them for the administration. As much as I, I do look forward from feedback and comment from them, I don't believe at this point this document is going to seriously alter. Whether we took another year with it, whether we sent it back to ordinance, or we waited for paling board, at this point, like I said, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with the document and, and how it is and stands now. And I, I don't think it would be like very different from, from where it is right now today. Okay, thank you for that. Councilor Caterina? Um, I would just weigh in before the vote also. Um, lest anyone thinks that I'm rushing things. Uh, I, I know that uh, this has been before ordinance, as I've mentioned, for a long time. Um, there have been numerous opportunities for the citizens of this town to weigh in, and they have. You guys are sitting here. You've been here. I give you credit. Um, I've gotten some good ideas from folks. I think I know some of it's been put into this document, but it's like anything that goes through a government process. It's not going to be perfect. That's the nature of democracy. Uh, there's input from voters, citizens, counselors, uh, and we are, um, I'm ready to move forward with it. I, I, I personally don't think it made any sense for it to go back to ordinance. We voted it out of ordinance and put it in the town council. So the ordinance, is, ordinance committee is a group of the part of the council advisory comes up with ideas, but then it needs to go to the whole council because we represent everybody in the town of Scarborough. Um, and I feel comfortable that it's come to the council, that we've worked on it. We, I feel we've worked diligently on it, and I agree with Councillor Holbrook that uh, what's come out here is may not be perfect, but it's, I think it's good. It's a good working document to, to start with, and I am looking forward to the planning board uh, Implementing this. That's it. Councilor Donovan. Uh, I think the one of the things that impressed me the most was the collaboration with the planning board through this. Uh, they have a much better idea than I think many of us do about the site plan review process and the tools they need to be able to uh, achieve good route results with specific applications. And they kept pushing us to, and said that our first reading was not where it needed to be. Uh, and we worked hard uh, for months. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at the end, our consultant said, as he was leaving last Thursday, uh, this is as good as he's seen, an effort to put a comprehensive uh, uh, process in place to protect the community, but yet allow for uh, cell coverage that will be appropriate. So I'm I'm happy to support this. Okay. Anyone okay. else? Yes, Council Blaze. I'd just like to make get some clarification. Really, uh, at our workshop last week brought up the fact that we have roughly 25 different zones in town and 21 of them allow special exceptions for telecommunications facilities. Does this supersede all of those? I don't think so. Uh -uh. No, but no. Dan, would you be prepared to speak on that, please? The version that's before you um, maintains telecommunications as special exceptions reviewed by the zoning board for all telecommunication facilities proposed in the residential districts. It adds the step that the council asked for on Thursday, that the planning board also participate in that review. So there's a planning board review and comment, and then a zoning board special exception for <coughs> telecommunication facilities in residential districts. Okay, so it's got to go through two reviews. In residential districts, it has to go through two reviews. 
in commercial zones, telecommunication facilities are reviewed by the planning board under this version because the planning board reviews commercial buildings, commercial architecture, all those things. Yep. So that's that's the process. Good. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Any anything else? Anything else? All set? Yep. Okay. With that. Um I have covered that, that, and okay. Everyone in favor? Opposed? No. Okay. Is there uh did you want to take a moment? Take yeah, a five minute recess? Yeah. Please. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> five minute recess.
Six is to act to authorize the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with the friends of Scarborough Hockey. Okay. Oh, just a couple of comments to introduce this matter. Uh, this this issue was the subject of a workshop uh, with the council back on October 1st. Based on the input uh, and discussion at that evening and some further input from staff, there's been another round of revisions. Uh, since this matter was tabled before it was ever considered, what was in the agenda uh, and what's before you this evening represents and is a reflection of all the updated uh, input. And if I could, I'd just like to highlight kind of the four or five things that have been added to the, to the document. Uh, based on the input from council, there is not a specific site mentioned in the memo at this point. Rather, it, there's kind of a general preliminary approval of it being allowed somewhere on the campus and that there's uh, a bit of an evaluation process to be done in short order and, in fact, done by uh, early December so these folks can <coughs> have some clarity in that regard. Uh, there's further um, language dealing with community use. That was the subject of a lot of conversation yep. with the council and the, and the public. Uh, that's both uh, in season when the ice is in and also off season. There's also a suggestion or a requirement that uh, off season use be considered <coughs> in the initial design so um, it's not built to preclude some sort of off season use. Uh, in the event that financial support from the town is ever needed for whatever reason, uh, we are uh, electing to have the opportunity, not that we, we take the opportunity, uh, that the town takes over the operations, and that's totally at our election uh, at the time if, if the need arises. There are no fee waivers being uh, requested, and there's a final approval that's essentially conditioned on um, when all the engineering details and the planning board approvals are in hand, in financial capacity shown that the council has the option of, of really understanding the totality of the proposal, uh, the site, and all of those impacts. So there's kind of a final checkpoint that the council, and I'm hopeful that these safeguards give the council some further comfort that uh, they could consider this, this evening so the folks can get about the business of fundraising, which uh, is certainly a tall order. Okay. Did, did we, was there any further presentations? No, I, I know folks right. from uh, the Friends of Scarborough Hockey are here and available for your questions. Uh, I didn't suggest to them that a okay. presentation was necessary. I'll go with uh, um, public comment on Order 1476. Three minutes, name and address. Martin Tripp, 26 Oceanwood. Intrinsically, basically, I'm against any of this type of operation where a nonprofit places its structures on private property, on public property. I was going to go around to my neighbors and I got a letter and there's four of us only that signed it that we were opposed to this just on that basis. When I went to my other neighbors, they asked questions of what the purpose was and to the best of my ability and how you were going to go about this. Uh, I tried to explain it, but then I found that it was taking me a half an hour to explain things that they weren't willing to come down to town to listen to. So there was eight or twenty, ten questions that the town council had on this thing, and these questions haven't gone away as far as I'm concerned. Each one of these questions that you asked the last time I was here should be addressed before this even gets started. The problem as I see it in this town, is you want the project, a committee, an ad hoc committee comes up here, states its purpose, and then they want to get the train rolling. So if there's an objection, as I have it, <coughs> they still want the thing to roll. So they change the schedule a little bit around here, and all of a sudden this train is rolling out the track, and then you can't stop it. They want a letter today so that they can start fundraising. Oh, I don't like the idea in the first place, but I like the less idea that every project that comes through this town is cut with a knife until it's acceptable to everybody. I'd like one time to see a schedule, to see something that's concrete and not just patched together. You may have faith in these guys, but there you go. Tom Hall just says, 
if something happens and this goes wrong, the town will have the option to pick up the building. Did I, did I understand it right? I don't know. But if something goes wrong, then the town can accept or pass on a mistake. You guys got to do better than this, really. I mean, let's get a plan. And I don't care where they build it, as long as it's not on town property. It has nothing to do with me. Somebody wants something? Put it out in the private arena. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to speak? I'm Ace Houghton, <coughs> Snowberry, Snowberry Drive. Uh, I spoke uh, briefly about parking the, the last time I was here, and I just want to add one thing in my uh, allowed three minutes. Uh, in the memorandum of understanding on the third page, paragraph 5-6, it's called, in the updated copy, it, it mentions that depending on the preferred site, the parties recognize that the project will likely require the use of existing parking spaces and may require the displacement of existing parking. Now, the only person, I don't know if this is a person, but it says it in part, they must obtain the consent of the school department. Now, is that school department the Board of Education? Is it the president of the superintendent of schools, or is it a committee, or who, who do they have to get this consent for taking away the parking lots that we just paid for? We are still paying for the high school parking lot, bond issues three or four years old. We're paying for the Wentworth parking, bond issues just sent out. We're paying for the new parking at the library find issues probably four or five years ago. None of them are paid for. And now we're willing to sign a consent that will give these away. Take your choice. Very bad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Bud Hanson. I mentioned to you earlier this evening, uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, one of my concerns with not in the, uh, the metropolitan Oak Hill area is because of my experience 40 years ago in uh, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and a friend of mine, George Wallace, uh, was very kind, and he put up the door to build the, the, the uh, hockey rink as well as the planetarium. It was very successful for a couple of years. <coughs> Finally, the expenses outruled the... Um, uh, Incoming income, so they had to do other things, which turned out, turned out to be rock concerts and uh, circuses, uh, play times, and the administration and the cost of the process was very, very high. One of the problems we had was the uh, invasion of other people coming in from other towns and other states to to visit some of the options going on. And living across the street in a, in a complex, which I happen to be the manager of it, so I got very involved with this, they would take parking places that were reserved for people who lived in the community. Uh, it came to a point where the police had to get involved, the fire department had to get involved, and it resulted in a small revolution in the little town of Fitchburg. So I suggested maybe we could find a place. I, I like the idea, the excitement of a, of a, of a hockey I think it's a good idea. Well, but please, not not in metropolitan uh, uh, Oak Hill. Maybe somewhere in the Hagers Parkway. Maybe somewhere there was some land available. Maybe some place where there's a lot of, of uh, home businesses available. And I think probably on the Hagers Parkway, you got you got the main turnpike, you could post the interstate, you've got a lot of activity, and Route 1 is very good. And also my experience with the team traffic coming in on Route 1 is pretty bad as it is. And the traffic flow has become more and more exciting. Uh, so I thought maybe take a real good hard look at this. And maybe don't let the excitement of it determine your common sense in doing it or not doing it. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to 
Florida 1476. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a move? Do I have a motion? Move, so. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Okay. Council discussion. I believe that Council Sinclair has some questions of Fosh. I just had one quick question. Would you like to go to the podium and please? Um, a question that I keep getting over and over again from the public is, and, and I think I have the answer to it, but I want to make sure I'm clear on it. In your budgeting, I understand your your plan is to hire like a, a manager or a jack of all trades type person to maintain. He'll be like the janitor and the Zamboni guy and. All that stuff, he's going to one person? So, no, generally what happens is there will be a rink manager. Yep. Depending on the needs of the facility, he'll uh -huh. hire whatever temporary employment you need okay. to make sure that everything gets covered. And in your budgeting, how long have you budgeted for that person? So, mm -hmm. it's a yearly budget. So, basically, the expense, income uh -huh. expense, balances including the rink manager. Okay. Right. So, one year. For the first year. So, I'm not sure I know your I know. It's... Just, I understand what you're trying to say, but what I'm trying to get to is I want to be clear on making sure that people, the, the people that I'm talking to, their fear is that, like some other people have said, this is a great opportunity, it's hype, it's exciting, which I completely agree with. Um, and I've been very impressed with the paperwork and the things that I've read about all of you and, and your plan. Their concern is what happens after. So I just was curious about that person I understand he'll hire temporary people, mm -hmm. but you're budgeting just your first year? No, no, no. So, so two things. So basically what we've done as part of the business plan yeah. is allocated enough money to fund the full first year without any income at all, just what? to be on the conservative side. Okay. And that, so that's without taking, like, you charge people when they come to see games or? Well, mostly it's ice rentals, right? So it'll be ice rentals and skate rentals. Got so it. The majority of the income will come from ice rentals. Okay. And the okay. boosters and will pay... Okay. Then the boosters also help participate? And, and, sure, any organization. Okay. So boosters are put in place, for example, at Scarborough yep. to subsidize the various programs. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure I was clear when I answered that. That's really, I, I know it's late. Everyone's exhausted. I just wanted to thank you. I appreciate you answering that. Thank you. Okay, Council Benedict. Yes, I have a question for you. <coughs> in the asking for a uh, undercut or whatever you want to call it for the property. What is the intention of FOSH in giving back to the community free hours for public skating or whatever needs to be involved in that? Do you have any anticipation of doing anything like that? So I, I think there's two parts to that answer. Uh, the first thing is as a 501c3, we must um, give a certain percentage back to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that's about a 5% uh, give back. Um, but the second thing, and this goes, I think, to the land lease, um, that the definition around that uh, has not been defined. Uh, and we'll have to figure that out, whether how much of uh, a monthly or yearly fee we'll be paying for that. So have you anticipated anything more than 5% for the value to the community to be able to use the facility? So 5% will be given back for free. Um, and then I have no trouble mm -hmm. or understanding your question. So 5% is given, right? Above and beyond that, we did not identify other place time to be given back, if that's your question. Right. I, I guess basically my question is the all American adage of this for that. If if you want the property at a lesser amount of money, what are you giving in return to the community? Fair, and I think and Tom, you may jump in here, that's gonna be part of the land lease agreement to figure out what is fair value. We've got clear feedback that we need to come up with what is fair value for that land lease. 
and, and we're not trying to look for a handout. So we really need to understand what a fair value is for that land lease and confirm it with everybody, and that'll be another approval process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for what it's worth, at this early juncture, the community use section um, preserves the thought, uh, though it doesn't quantify the quid pro quo or what remuneration there might be, but it, it does uh, preserve the thought that during the time ICE is maintained, all efforts shall be made to allow town and school-sponsored recreational and educational uses. In addition, there shall be consistent, conveniently scheduled open skate time available to the public. And then during the off-season, the town shall have the unencumbered right to schedule uh, the use of the facilities based on their maintenance requirements and fee structures to be sorted through. So admittedly, we don't have all that sorted through, but that notion that you speak to is uh, preserved, I think, uh, and recognized here, details to be finalized before we sign anything. There's no dollar sign assigned to any of that? No. It's or percentage or? It's just premature. We don't have those numbers yet, but I, I would certainly recommend to the council that you do not um, offer the uh, sign the lease document until you have the assurances that you need at that time. By s by signing this document of understanding, are we committing no. to providing land? There is a, I'll call it a preliminary a tacit approval that um, we're willing to work with them and locate them on the campus somewhere, site to be determined, terms to be determined. Oh, yeah. But is it black and white, or can no. we back out of it? We have preserved the option of final approval. Once you know the site, mm -hmm. the uh, issues, uh, potential impacts of that site, uh, and we're several months away from knowing those details, frankly. The real chicken of the egg challenge here is that they have a, a very steep hill to climb, which is to raise five and a half million bucks. Uh, without that, this is a no-go. And um, I think what this document is all about is to give them the assurances and the comfort that they can go out into the community and try their best to raise the money, and at the same time, give us the assurances that we uh, we need to protect the public's interest. Have you, by any chance, gotten any offers from anybody else in the area? From, uh, from a land standpoint? Yes. So when we first started out, we looked at several pieces of property, and we still are looking at several pieces of property, because we do not know that this will be the final viable site for the arena. Uh, so we'll continue that process as well. So yes, we've approached several uh, pieces of property in the area, and everybody's mentioned Haggis, so we have been out there as well. And we'll continue to look. Anybody at offering free land? No. <laughs> but Just I us. will say, I, that to be totally transparent, they have offered um, shared. Shared land. Shared parking area. Because again, the, the rink will not need the parking area in the off season. Right? right. So there are opportunities for that parking area to be used for other purposes. Hmm. <coughs> okay. Council Caterina. Um, if I may. Um, uh, Councillor um, Blaze, uh, under Section 8 of the MOU, it specifically states that this is not a contract. I always look for that in the business that I'm in. Um, that says that uh, we acknowledge and agree that even if this MOU is fully executed, neither party here too has any obligation to the other to consummate the transactions and arrangements contemplated unless and until binding agreements are entered into by parties. This document constitutes only a non-binding memorandum of understanding setting out framework for potential agreement, but neither party is obliged to enter into any agreement whatsoever by virtue of preparation, execution, or delivery of this MOU. So. If that's the wording, why are you waiting for raising money? So there was four, one of the things the Flash Board looked at was four things um, to kick off a major fundraising event. And I mentioned these at the workshop, and they were a business plan, which we completed, a facility construction design we completed. As of yesterday, we received 501c3 approval of our application. So that was the third. The fourth one is a site location. So when we go ask for donations, we're going to be able to say, and we've identified this location where we'll be putting a nice arena, as opposed to, and once we get money, we'll go find a place mm -hmm. and try to build it there. All right. So we're trying to give more solid direction as to where this ice arena would be located. 
For what it's worth, it doesn't say it in so many words, but uh, the, the December 3rd date by which we shall uh, identify the site on the campus, uh, that's not by mistake. That's the night of the council meeting. My expectation is that after this evaluation process and the site is identified, that the council would consider that and approve that. Um, so there will be a, a fairly immediate uh, check-in period based on that. Yeah. Council Holbrook. So um, I guess I'm just going to dive in here real quick. Some of the interesting things that are different um, compared to the first time we had this and in, into the now. Are we doing discussion now, correct? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to support it. it again, it's, it's an MOU. Um, I'm actually familiar with that process. We, we had that process for the um, broad term project. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's a non-binding agreement. It just says that we're interested in this as a concept. We're going to let our parties work with your parties, and you know, this is some general stuff that and criteria we're looking for. And show me a document that I can vote for or against. Um, certainly, it's a, like I said. You know, there's been a lot of changes. Um, some of the interesting stuff coming through is, you know, a little more emphasis around what some community use opportunities. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think it's probably clear there's not a ton of support for you know the high school site, but certainly, you know, conceptually we could be open to something else. Um, so again, I, I'm not too ruffled and you know, I I'm, I'm happy to kinda let the process you know play out and, and just kinda figure where it lands. Um, there was one other thing, I'm sorry, there was something else I wanted to say, but it's too late and I don't remember now, so. <laughs> Councilor Donovan. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a big question about doing business with a private entity. <clears throat> My view of where we are as a community, where we've been with the recession, is that we can't afford multi-million dollar projects for anything other than what we need as a town. We might need fire, police, schools. Those are, those are things you have to provide uh, as a town. There's always one. In the then, there's, <laughs> then there's the category of things that would benefit the town, would really contribute to the town. Uh, and those fall into the category of a community center, a swimming pool, uh, an ice rink, uh, and <clears throat> but they're very expensive, and we can't afford them. So the only way that communities have been doing these sorts of things when they're in the situation we're in is public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes forward and says, I'll raise $5 million, I'll build the building, uh, then... Uh, they've got my attention. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm blind to the risks because as the MOU points out, we have every intention of protecting ourselves in every way possible for business risks, liability risks, uh, level of operation and standards that we have as an expectation. They're all in the MOU uh, and they're going to be pretty tough when they're done. Uh, I'm okay with using town land in some circumstances. Uh, here, this is going to be part of the town. It's going to be perceived as part of the town in much the same fashion that our public library is perceived on the municipal campus, perceived as part of the town. The town doesn't own the public library. It's, 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 a, it's a profit, uh, a no. private organization uh, that runs the library, but it makes sense to have it on public space. It's a very valuable thing to have in proximity to our schools. Well, this makes the same sense. One of the big advantages is our kids don't travel. They probably have uh, a hockey team probably <laughs> has you know 50 practices in 20 games, 10, aw 10 home, 10 away. Well, that means out of the 70 times that they would otherwise travel, now they're home 60. 
and traveling 10. So, I mean, that, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, if we can get kids to wake up an hour later, they're going to be that much better to do what they're really supposed to be doing in school, and that is learning. And I think that's a, a critical element for me to put it on the campus. So I'm, I'm good. People probably have heard I don't like the high school site. I think it's kind of jammed in there. Uh, uh, I think there would be issues, site plan review issues that would come up that would teach us very quickly it's not a terrific site. I think the campus that we have, and we're lucky that the people who came before me planned to, to acquire all this space. And, and looking at the map, there are other places we can put it. Uh, and I think we will settle on that in the next 60 days. Um, I did notice in the paper the other day that Hennebunk <laughs> did the exact same thing. Smaller scale, but they did a, a skating rink uh, in a public-private partnership on public land, uh, right in the, uh, in the town, downtown area. So this is part of what's going on. Um, so I'll stop there. I think that's... I support it, uh, and I, res I like the way the MOU protects us as an initial document. We've got a lot of work to do, uh, but I think in the end, the community, if this comes off, will be very pleased with the outcome. Um, I, don't, I just want to add that I, I'm supporting this, too, for all the aforementioned items that have been brought up. That's all. Thank you. Anyone down here? Um, I want to thank Councillor Holbrook and Councillor Donovan um, for, for their comments. I feel the same way. I'm supporting this tonight also. Um, exact sentiment. So um, is there any more further discussion? Okay. We we'll see no more further discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. In business. And a new business. Thank you. And a new business Thank order you. number 1489 is the first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to chapter 405 uh, Scarborough Zoning Ordinance to amend section 6 definitions. Okay. Um, Would you like me to introduce it? Yes, yes. please. And, yes. I'll begin. It's very, very brief. Uh, I know Councillor Holbrook may have some comments as well, but what's before you this evening is. Uh, a simple but I think very significant modification that the, the Housing Alliance uh, is recommending to the Council and that is to change our definition uh, of affordable housing and that's both for owner-occupied affordable housing units and renter-occupied affordable housing units. And in essence, the standard has been um, and has never changed, frankly, since it was adopted, 120% of area Medium. median income and the proposal is to move that to 80% or less of area median income as the, the basic definitional standard of what is affordable. And perhaps Councillor Holbrook has further comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no. No public, comment? public comment. Would anybody like to comment on uh, 1489? Member of the public. Seeing none, I have a motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion, Council Holbrook. So this comes to you, um, so uh, Housing Alliance has, has been going through and beginning to just kind of um, look at overall general policy that we have in place. And um, certainly the 120% of area medium income is extremely out of line with just kind of standards and known documents, you know, for, for, you know from, for instance, um, State planning, other communities, you know, it's really out of line at 120% being the definition of affordable. Um, so what happens is we're going from, you know, which is kind of hard to explain because depending on family size, that 80% dynamic changes the price tag on a house. <clears throat> um, but you're going at 120% roughly from saying 120% is affordable and that's roughly $300,000, $325,000 homes, down to 80% is what we define as affordable, and you're somewhere in that two to $50,000 home. Yep. So, um, like I said, this really just brings us in line with 
current standards and, and, and what's going on in other communities. Okay. Anyone else? Council Blaze. Yeah. Can you define a household? Define a household? Yeah. For it's a number of occupants. Yeah. It's just the number of occupants? The income slides depending on household uh, size, and then uh. that's defined by number of occupants in that household. But how do you define a, a household? Man and woman and two children, or what? It can be single can be up to, again, the number of occupants define the household. So it could be five guys. No, they 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 must be related. Well, that's that's what I'm getting at. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh. Well, I have to look it up. I mean, are we going to run into? I can't remember. If, if we're if we're offering affordable housing, are we going to run into a situation where you have a whole bunch of of guys going to college? <laughs> I mean, we all know that people in college are they, really hurting. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I should probably. Th this all this does is generate the definition of what we define affordable housing as. So it defines it at it's 80 percent of AMI. That's a number that's released. Um, to us from Housing and Urban Development, I believe. Um, it, it's not a number we create. It, it's a number that's given to us. And from there, as far as, you know, that, that, that's a policy question as far as kind of what I think what you're getting at. If we had it an affordable house, for instance, in the Habitat project, realistically, no. It, it probably wouldn't be five single guy I mean there's a qualification process, there's a homeowner process, there I mean there's other series that that come into play. Um usually again this is just mimicking what's kind of common practice. Um again, you know, Main State Housing and a lot of those other programs already have this similar dynamic set up with, you know, house family household incomes is how it has, how it's usually defined. Just as I, if I could, the Housing Alliance uh, considered a much more elaborate um, mm -hmm. definitional change, and I, I think there's a commitment to keep working on that. Mm -hmm. They really saw this as the important first piece um, to come forward with, but I think you'd expect in the coming months perhaps further recommended changes, and that may be the, the, the time to address those questions. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? And that way, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Order number 14-90 <coughs> is act on the request from the Coastal Waters and Harbor Commission to utilize funds from the Pine Point Waterfront Reserve Capital Improvement Account to purchase a crane system to be installed at the Pine Point Pier in an amount not to exceed $9,000 and to authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents related to this purchase. Tom? Yes. Um, I guess I'm somewhat embarrassed to, to report to you that uh, the new pier, it's about four years old now, uh, and I, I guess I can only blame the design engineers, but the hoist systems that were placed on that pier apparently were not, uh, are, are clearly are not capable of handling uh, those conditions, uh, and I'm not sure um, why those were spec'd out, but they've been perennial problems for us, so much so one of them has completely failed and cannot be repaired. It just doesn't make sense for us to keep putting money into them. This proposal has come uh, through the Coastal Harbors and Waters Commission and it is to replace one of the two uh, cranes with an appropriate crane for outdoor use in this application. Um, many on this council will recall the creation of the fund that's mm -hmm. referenced here mm -hmm. and it was in fact created with monies left over from the pier project. Uh, came in under budget, and rather than sweeping those into the general fund, the council at the time created a reserve account, and I think this is certainly an appropriate use to use these monies. And I will just mention I heard uh, um, from one of the fishermen who uses that pier on a daily basis, and he pleaded with me uh, that we move this matter forward because right now they don't have a crane of any sort and are relying on the tide. And that's uh, this is the high part of the season, and so. Uh, he was very interested in knowing this is on the uh, agenda and, and was pleased to hear that uh, the council will be considering it. How much How much money is in this account? Currently there is, it was in my memo 
about $30,000, $30,587. I move approval. Oh, wait a second. second. We have to um, public comment on 1490. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak? I don't have any objection. He answered my question. Uh, just tell me there's a, there's a, a, a dock that goes out and you come in and out with your fishing dock, right? And then there's a small dock and a, and a big dock, right? There's, there's three docks over there, right? Okay, well, just two or go ahead, make your comments, and we'll answer them. That's my yeah. that's my okay. question. Is there two docks or three docks over there? Mm -hmm. there's there's, maybe I've got it wrong. Would you like me to answer? There's only one there's, commercial there's fish pier. There's one commercial fishing pier, and then there was another dock. Or the historical one still remains, but it's foot there's traffic. There's a second dock, right? Yes, but it's foot traffic only. It does not support yeah, any of the commercial. Then, there, then there's the one for loading. The, I just didn't want to drive over there and say, I can't remember. <laughs> That's all. It's not a question of any big significance. But there's three things in the water over there, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. It's kind of simple. Okay. I just didn't want to take a ride. All right, anyone else? <laughs> yes. Uh, Robert Rovner, 4 King Street. Um, yeah. I just don't know what the crane's used for. What? What, what are they using the for? Well, there's a significant tidal change in the Scarborough River. Um, there's this, at low tide, it can be uh, almost 20 feet difference between the water level and the top of the pier. And, and what they they're lowering uh, all sorts of materials, such as bait for their yeah. lobster business and product at the end of the day. And there, there are two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Council discussion. Councilor Holbrook. Um, we'll be offering to, I should say, I will be recusing myself. <laughs> As you see in the memo, um, there's a bit of a conflict of interest in the letter of support, and who is a member of the committee is David Green, which is my <laughs> father. Um, so I will not be voting on this item, but I, I do want to express. Um, my sincere support for it. You know, it's, it's a much needed apparatus, as you mentioned, the bait, crates, traps, all, all those things. And so I hope you do support it. Okay. Um, Council Benedict. Uh, as the, the liaison to this particular committee, uh, I know that they spent a lot of time because they don't particularly like to spend money, whether it's in the fund or not in the fund. Mm -hmm. But the problem, as it was already spoken about, was in the, the initial cranes that are there, they have been an ongoing nickel and dime problem and really never worked 100% except on day one. And at this point, to replace the crane, this is not to be understood that they're going to fix what's there. This is a new crane. And uh, for the working men and women that are down there, right. I think we happen to owe it to them. Uh, and I'd be in 100% support of this. Council Blaze, are you saying this is a replacement? Yes. Yeah. Hmm? Just to clarify, there are two. This replaces one of them permanently. Uh, we are making arrangements to have the other repaired just to really make it so they have something operable uh, during the height of the season. But um, I suspect that one that will repair will, in fact, break again, and I, I'm not interested in spending more money there. So there's one crane now, and then we're going to have two. No, no there there's two cranes. Two cranes. Yeah. Both are inoperable. We're, we're getting We're replacing repair. one. What, the one that we're replacing, what are we doing with that one? I, I'm selling it? I've not asked the it's question broken. whether it has re resale value. Yeah. At the very least, there's scrap value. Scrap value. At the very least, there's scrap value. I can't speak okay. to its okay. uh, mechanical value. Just curious. I have one question. Um, the thirty thousand dollars that's in the account, where'd that come from? Well, the project was supported through grant funding, as I recall, mm -hmm. and there was also some local bonding that went into the project. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have to say it's local monies at this point. So they they're not paying fees. The use of that dot? They are paying fees. That's a different question. Um, okay. 
to the extent that fees are paid in for commercial users, uh, that goes to help support the operational costs. There's electricity and, and water expense. Uh, any overage uh, in additional fees beyond the operational expense does go into this account. That's what I wanted to get at. So, okay. yeah. Sorry. Okay. I should have made myself a little more Sorry, clear. I'm not thinking but They clearly. do uh, contribute money to, the, uh, to what's down there. Um, anyone else? Mm. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Order number 1491 is act on the request to accept the following streets pursuant to Title 23 of the Maine Revised Statutes, subsection 3025, and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance, Old uh, Colony Lane uh, and Winding Way located in the Old Colony Park subdivision. Yes, very quickly by introduction, uh, back in September of 2013, uh, this council approved a memorandum of understanding with the Colony Park Homeowners Association that contemplated uh, certain improvement work uh, to both Winding Way and Old Col Colony Lane, uh, and which would ultimately end up with the council uh, accepting the, the streets as public streets. I'm pleased to report that we are, uh, both parties have honored their sides of that agreement, and we're here tonight uh, requesting that, the, that the, the council take action to accept these two roads as public streets. Okay, would any member of the public like to speak to Order 1491? Anyone? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion. This, the yes. name is Old Colony Lane, right? Not Lane. Land. Yes. Lane. I beg your Lane. pardon, was it wrong? Well, yes, it was a typo. I apologize. Okay. The clerk's fault. Yes, Lane, thank you. The hotel. Council Holbrook? Nothing? Nothing. Wow. Way too late. <laughs> yeah, it's way too late. Okay, I guess we're done with this one. Um, all those in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. Order number uh, 1492 is act on the proposal from the Scarborough Land Trust and the Friends of the Scarborough Wash to pay back taxes with interest and cost of cleanup of property located at 11 Bradford Lane, Map U25, Lot 16A, in an amount of $38,846.74 and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents relating to the transfer of ownership of this parcel to the Scarborough Land Trust. Okay, would anybody of the public like to speak on Order 1492? Anyone? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So I've so moved. Second. Okay, second. Do we get a second? Did I hear a second? Do we get a yeah. second? Yeah, there was yeah, a I second. Did. Okay, I didn't hear it. Sorry. Okay. First. <clears throat> Council discussion. Council Good. Holbrook. I do want to allow for some some to just. I told you it's late. Sorry. <laughs> right. I do want to allow for some council discussion, but I do want to present um, my my fellow councilors with an idea. Um, I'm going to ask shortly for a motion to table this item to our next meeting, which will be November, the first meeting yeah. in November, um, which would allow a little bit of time for Tom to, to work with the land trust on a slightly different twist uh, of this proposal. Um, what I would be looking for and what I'm hoping for is that the town retains um, basically an easement so that as you come down the property, this is, um, there's already a house on this property and it overlooks the marsh. And I know it's the goal and the intention of the land trust to take the lower portion and honor the original deal and, and likely go to main inland fish and wildlife. What I'm hoping for is for Tom to have some time to negotiate an easement for a um, small gravel parking lot at the end of the driveway so that the parking is in place and an easement to that as well as a footpath and easement to some benches so that you may go down there and sit on these nice benches and enjoy the scenic view. Um, so that, that's the purpose of, of tabling that just to work out whatever details that need to maybe go, go in line with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, have you made the motion yet? I or not yet, but... It, uh, just a moment. Council Sinkway. Oh no, I was just gonna say oh. I, I would I would absolutely support that. I had made the original 
motion, so I'm sorry. I was overstepping myself. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> So well, I will. Move I would that. second her. Okay. That, let's put it that okay, way. Okay, so that's a motion. That's a Table. second. Non-debatable. Non Table. Non. Yes. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Second. Standing in special committees reports. <laughs> we'll start with <laughs> Council of St. Clair. Um, I don't have any. Okay. None. Okay, Councilman. <coughs> Over. I'm pulling them up as we speak. Okay, Councilor uh, Katerina. Um, I don't have anything. Councilor Donovan. No, nothing. Uh. Okay. Okay. Back, Come back to, to me. Back to me. Um, so historic uh. preservation um, is hosting, as you may have recalled me speaking to, um, an, a property owners meeting. There was a mailing. Again, this is um, not a closed meeting, it's an open meeting. We do invite anybody that would be interested um, to come down and or you know and participate in it. But it's an owner out owner outreach meeting in order to engage um, basically the vested parties in what would be the best way to help them and then to encourage um, historic preservation. So that meeting is on the twenty first, which is a Tuesday at six thirty here at Town Hall. And Housing Alliance will be meeting on Thursday, November 6th at their regular meeting. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, just the, um, earlier that they're trying to trudge through the many layers of paperwork set to get through things. Um, appointments Committee did meet this evening. I do not have any names to post. Um, I need to gather a little more information, but we will be meeting again prior to um, the next council meeting at 645. Um, on the first meeting of November. Um, I think that's, that's it for now for the liaison and committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to report, so town manager's report. Three quick things. I'll be brief. Um, the dredge project is back on. Uh, the co our contractor, I would say, of preference, but uh, we're very pleased that Southwind Construction received the bid. They did the work back in 2004. We're very comfortable and pleased with that. They will mobilize starting November 10th and be up and running by really uh, the third week of November. They expect to run 24-hour operations, and it's going to be about a two-month process. So, in fact, they're hopeful to be done by the first of the year. Um, also, there's a ribbon cutting and open house at Wentworth this Saturday, October 18th at 1 p.m. And lastly, Councillor Blaze asked that I just respond publicly. Uh, someone inquired, uh, what happens should the revaluation bond question fail? And frankly, there's no other f uh, funding provided for in the budget. So uh, at the very least, the schedule that we had anticipated would not happen, though I expect, given the interest, this matter would be a, the subject of discussion at next year's budget next spring. Um, so it, it would likely be delayed a year, subject to funding, of course. Thank you. Okay. That uh, closing council member comment. Council St. Clair. Sure. I just have one quick comment. Um, uh, Kyle, my son's um, second annual 5K is this weekend. Um, on Saturday, we have over 400 runners already um, signed up. And um, it's actually in and around the St. Max area. And if anybody wants to come out, there's going to be a lot of fun things for kids. And I think there's going to be some massage therapists there and um, lots of goodies. And um, so we'd love to have anybody there that would like to be there. So. It. Hey, Council of Blaze. Uh, just one item. Um, at last week's SEDCO annual meeting, I had a conversation with Paul Austin mm -hmm. about uh, um, the property over in Pleasant Hill Road. Benjamin Farm. The Benjamin Farm, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about the possibility of going over there and taking a walk through. He says, He'd love to. He'd love to be able to have all of us come over there sometime, mm -hmm. and he'll give us a tour and tell us approximately what what they're planning to do with that. So uh, I'll send out an email to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, just let me know awesome. uh, approximately when you might be available, and I'll arrange it with Paul. That'd be wonderful. <coughs> 
Thank you. Councilor Benedict. I just have uh, one thing to bring up to the general public. It's hunting season. <laughs> it's bow and arrows for deer. But there are some guns out there, not for deer yet. But try and remain safe when you have a dog. Put one of the orange collars on them. And when you go out yourself, wear orange. That's the only thing that I just have to be able to identify you. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Katarina. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, just a reminder to folks to vote. November 4th, um, a member of our audience today spoke about um, concern about people not voting, and just so she'll know. <laughs> Actually, Scarborough has one of the highest turnouts in the state. We usually average about 62% of registered voters, which I know doesn't sound high. It would be great if we had 100%, but we don't. Mm -hmm. But it's um, one of the highest we got beaten out by. It was just Bangor last year, wasn't it? Usually we have the highest turnout on regular regular elections. You can vote now uh, at town hall. The last day for voting or turning, or excuse me, enough turning your absentee ballots. But voting in town hall is, and I'm going to October 30th. Is that right? Thursday the 30th. Without a special exception. without a special exception. So keep that in mind. You can register um, even on election day. Um, and if you have any questions about anything to do with the elections or voting, my expert sitting next to us would be toting. Um, and just, you know, I, this is just a personal note. I, I get very, very frustrated, and this is just personally, uh, when I hear, you know, at uh, candidate forums or wherever that people feel that there's a lack of communication um, with the town council and the community. Um, and maybe in the past it was, but we're working really hard to improve that. And I'm hoping that people, you know, give us some credit for doing workshops. I know I always attempt to answer every email, and, and I apologize if I miss emails, but I attempt to at least give an answer to every email. And I know the other counselors do the best, too, in returning phone calls and communicating and having workshops. and. And whatever. So I just find it an extremely frustrating and, and uh, disappointing to, to continue to hear that. But we keep trying. That's it. Thank you, Councilor Donovan. Just a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to congratulate uh, uh, Mike Murphy, the Scarborough High School golf coach, oh, yeah. and the Scarborough <laughs> golf team on a state championship. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people the size of the print that is on the second page of the sports page covering the golf scores is one I scrutinize, but uh, a first win for the uh, Discovery Golf Team and for Mike Murphy in 27 years is what was reported. Wow. So I think that's uh, terrific. A, a team in which everyone contributed. It's a team uh, sport, and they take the top four scores out of five, and and our scores were, were, were very evenly. No, no real low ones, no real high ones. So it was a great team effort. Uh, I also wanted to congratulate the Scarborough High School field hockey team, uh, which just completed uh, a regular se undefeated regular season. Uh, and uh, manager Tom Hall and I were in the audience, uh, me to see he to see his daughter, and me to see my granddaughter, number seven, Rose Kirsch. So <laughs> you'll have to remember that. Uh, and uh, so uh, it was a great season for that team. Thank you. Council Holbrook. Um, so I do have a list for council condolences that we, we typically offer. Um, so we have uh, Reverend William McNeil Baxter to the family of James David DiPietro. Um, Mr. DiPietro was a Pine Point resident and a fairly well-known face down there. Um, he was you know, a fisherman and a clam digger and, and um, place very well known and, and will be missed. Um, Arlene Adams Gumayas, Joseph A. Dusalt, and I hope I pronounced that route right. Um, he was um, a resident at the Maine Veterans Home. He was also um, in the service. He was with the 392nd Medical Company and also a the owner and founder of Joseph's by the Sea down in Old Orchard. Um, 
uh, Francis Farwell, Stuart Crosby Guile, Arthur um, Balcom, Frederick Earl Colbushen, Raymond Osborne, um, Mary Simpson, and that's it for condolences. Um, I do just want a friendly reminder that the cold season is quickly upon us, and as we do every year, we do try to campaign and fundraise a little bit for our town fuel assistance mm -hmm. program and uh, that we do with Project Grace. There are still clink bags, and I'm hopefully we will always have clink bags in the town clerk's office, and you can help yourself and fill one up and drop it off. Um, and all proceeds for those like, that go into the Town Fuel Assistance Program. Um, I just would like to reiterate what um, Jean Marie had touched on, that we do have you know, an election coming up. Do try to vote. It, it's, it's certainly easier now than I think it's ever been in years past, especially with absentee voting. So, you know, I appreciate you, know, you can't always get time off of work, but on a single day, but, but we have a good gap here. So let, let's continue the momentum of having good turnouts and good numbers. Um, I guess the last thing I, I want to say about communication, uh, I want to touch on the communication because that, that has come up a lot. Um, th there is to a certain certain point, and, 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 and I, I truly mean no disrespect to anybody by this, but, but there does come a, a, sm a small point where you do need to take a little ownership of yourself, I, I think, a little bit. If you don't ever make an effort to find out what's going on, and I had this conversation <laughs> recently with a neighbor, um, if you never check a website, you never pick up a paper, you never look on Facebook, you never look on, you know, never catch a meeting, you know, if you make no effort to know what's going on, then you're likely not to know what's going on. So. Um, I, I do think there's a little bit of civic duty to try to pay a little attention. Do I think we can improve upon it? Absolutely. There's always room for improvement, but but a little self self involvement sometimes goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So those are it for my comments. Okay. Uh, just real quick, I'll touch on um, we had uh, Sedco annual meeting that we went to. Um, uh, most of us. Um, and uh, what was uh, special about it was um, Rock, Rocky Risbear and the Risbear family were uh, honored for their contributions to the community through all the years that they lived here and uh, built houses. And, and actually, they took part a lot of times in helping the town out in, in issues that we had. And I remember we had some roads washed out, and they were the first mm. ones to come right in and help us out. So they've really contributed a lot to this uh, community. Uh, St. Maximilian, they were um, a big part of in, in uh, helping to build that. And um, I meant they've just contributed a lot to this community. It was nice to see uh, at the forum at SEDCO, not just honoring new businesses, but the uh, businesses, uh, one of the businesses that are here, probably one of the biggest, and, um, and their contributions. So with that, I'll ask for an adjournment. So moved. Second.